The first topic is who is master blaster to clinch diagnosis IBD. For that, I will request Dr. Jignesh Patel sir, Dr. J.K. Anand sir, Dr. Mustafa Rangwala sir and Dr. Chelapati Rao sir as a chairperson. The speaker will be invited by the chairperson. Good morning, all of you. Now, in my practice, I have learned that we all give exams when the patient comes to you. You have to prove yourself. And those who help for that are the pathologist, radiologist, and the endoscopist. They take, they form the back bone of the patient, and we take the credit of having diagnosed. So it's a good teamwork. And let us see who is the master blaster of clinical diagnosis for inflammatory bowel disease. It's a very good uh, topic involving the pathologist Dr. Roma Patel from Swasthya Lab Ahmedabad, radiologist Dr. Deepak Patel from Infocus Ahmedabad, and Dr. Saurabh Kheria, who is an endoscopist from Ames, New Delhi. So who's going to come first? Roma Ben. So may I please request the pathologist, Dr. Roma Patel, to come on the dais. Good morning all the faculties and seniors and friends. Uh, today I have to prove as a histopathologist has a major role in the diagnosis of the inflammatory bowel disease. As we know the IBD is a distinct entity. It's not like a usual colitis or inflammation. It's an inflame, uh, immune mediated inflammatory disorder. Uh, it's an idiopathic chronic progressive intermittent relapsing and alternating exacerbations and remissions and currently it is like an incurable disease. When we talk about the inflammatory bowel disease, it's a two tail of the disease. One is a Crohn's disease and another is a ulcerative colitis. So I will prove the histopathologist has a major uh, role to diagnose the inflammatory bowel disease by presenting a case. Uh, uh, he is a 25 year old gentleman present with the history of abdominal pain since one month. He found iron deficiency anemia on investigation of abdominal pain. There is history of changes of the bowel habit and the endoscopist has done biopsy from the right sided colon and ileum with the three differential they have given on the clinical basis. One is infective eosinophilic disease and there is early onset of IBD. Maybe the history is just a one month old. So this is the microphotographs of the ileal biopsy. Always the potential questions of the endoscopist is, is the ileal biopsy showing the features of IBD? So this is a ileal mucosa. start pointer. Uh, there is a villiform architecture. Uh, here it's showing the villiform architecture with ulcerations. There is a patchiness of inflammation. If you see here there is no inflammation. There is again there is a slide is very busy with the chronic lymphoplasmacytic inflammation. There are few cryptapses and cryptitis. This is the another uh, microphotographs which showing the pseudo 
pylori gland metaplasia moment we see in the biopsy the pseudo pylori gland metaplasia we definitely say this bio, this patient is having a history more than a one month because pylori glands will come in the ileum uh, when there is a features are more than a one month history because generally the pylori gland is a part of the gastric mucosa so once we see in the ileal mucosa uh, it is suggest the features of the chronicity this is again we see the uh, right sided there is a crypt which is like a uh, test tube arrangement in a rack but the this patient's uh, biopsy is showing the significant changes of the chronicity because identification of the chronicity is the primary requisite for the diagnosis of the inflammatory bowel disease because activity can come in infectious colitis it can come in the early ischemic colitis but moment we see the chronicity along with the pseudo pylori gland metaplasia here we see there is a one crypt another crypt is coming out from it there is a two crypt fusion there is a crypt shortening so all are the features of the chronicity we usually see in the ibd cases now the colonoscopic biopsy show the nice microgranuloma this is the microgranuloma it's a collection of the epithelioid histiocytes in the superficial lamina propria these granulomas are like very loose just collection of the 10 to 12 epithelioid histiocytes this is another microgranuloma which is very nicely sitting in the superficial lamina propria so this case is very straightforward whatever radiology whatever endoscopy finding this case we have given its the findings are consistent with the Uh, Crohn's iliocolitis because there is ileum is also involved and colon is also involved. If they have done the only ileal biopsy, I can just suggest and suspect the IBD because the microgranuloma. Moment I see the microgranuloma, the IBD Crohn's colitis is a classic uh, findings in a inflammatory bowel disease of Crohn's disease. So in this biopsy, there is ulceration, severe activity, cryptitis, crypt abscess, and there are marked changes of the chronicity like. chronic lymphoplasmocytic inflammation creep branching creep disc array creep fusion and pylori gland metaplasia and microgranulomas in superficial lamina propria without necrosis so this is a crohn's iliocolitis so generally we favor the uh, paid pattern p for the pattern so we see the distribution of the inflammation once we see the ibd there is a two disease we already talk it's a crohn's and uc so uc is a diffuse inflammation in the bowel wall here it is the patchiness patchiness is very important if you give me the biopsy only from the ulceration i might be not seen the patchiness so always took the biopsy from the little normal looking area mildly involved area and ulcerated areas so we can see very nicely the patchiness on the biopsy then there is a activity it is always by the neutrophilic inflammation in the lamina propria surface epithelium cryptitis crypt abscess and then we will give there is a probability of ibd according to the which are the strongest finding in the biopsies and uh, as we know the d is for the dysplasia it is according to the low grade and high grade and commonly seen with the ulcerative colitis this is the case number 2 the uh, it's a 64 year old female patient symptomatic since 2 months on and off abdominal pain diarrhea 2 to 3 times per day Uh, he has a she has a history of taking uh, steroid for the arthritis also history of nsaid so they have done the ileal and ic wall biopsy with the ulceration nodularity dilated ic wall radiology has not done that time so it's a query tb query ibd and there is a because of the history of nsaid there is a nsaid induced uh, uh, iliocolitis so this is a uh, like uh, if i see the low power na there are uh two granulomas predominantly that pink one thing is a granulomas so i have to look in the high power this is very nice granuloma which is very confluent large and there is central pink is a necrosis and this is typically caseous necrosis so we have done the jeden stain the necrosis uh, the granulomas is predominantly submucosal 
there is two granulomas here one is submucosal and one is at the sitting between the lamina propria and muscularis mucosi so this is also a very straightforward case it's a necrotizing granulomatous inflammation the findings are like tuberculosis so central caseous necrosis langhans giant cell there are villus blunting and prominent pear patches and jaden strain was negative so this is a classic case of tb so how will you dif how we differentiate the microgranuloma for this so the granulomas in the crohn's disease they are situated superficially in the lamina propria like the tb granulomas are predominantly submucosal so sometimes in endoscopic biopsy we just biopsy the mucosa and little bit muscularis mucosi submucosa most of the time will not come in the biopsy so when there is a no granuloma seen with little architecture alteration we still put the differential is infective more over the ibd because tuberculous granulomas are most of the time submucosal but if they are tuberculous granuloma they are large confluent and there is a necrosis this is the case number 3 the 25 year old male increased frequency of stool since 2.5 months there is a bloating nausea weight loss ileum is showing just erythema and cecum and ascending colon ulcers so ileum on scope is normal cecum and ascending colon ulcers i asked them the how was the ulcer they are transverse linear so they are mixed ulcers like transverse linear and entire cecum and ascending colon is patchily involved So this is a ileal biopsy, which is exactly normal. There is a prominent lympho follicle, villa are intact. There is no inflammation. There is no activity. So the according to the scopy, this is normal. So this is the ascending colon and cecum biopsy. Here it is very ulcer uh, ulcerative. There is a creep branching. But when we saw the deep cut, now there are one. two and three granulomas and they are like a medium size granuloma they are submucosal but there is no necrosis so still there are open two differential this could be a ibd this could be a tuberculosis but as we see like ileum with no specific pathology and only the granuloma seen in the ascending colon and cecum so and mild architecture alteration so in view of this we have just suggest it's a tuberculous inflammation is favored over ibd however the close follow up on ekt treatment uh, is mandatory in this case so they have done the follow up after one month and still the patient complaints are persist there is no weight gain they at uh, this time they have done the biopsy from the ileum and they have done the upper gi scopy also uh, so duodenal biopsy has been also taken so now the ileum this is the lower photograph is a previous ileal biopsy and this is the upper uh, is a uh, recent uh, ileal biopsy now see in a one month the ileum has lots of inflammation there is architecture alteration there is creep shortening Uh, this is the duodenal biopsy rather than ileum the duodenal biopsy is very busy there is lots of inflammation and severe chronic active duodenitis so this time there is severe chronic active ileitis there is duodenitis so we have suggested the ibd crohn's disease with the upper gi involvement after the one month follow up of the ekt so this case has been changed now to the uh, ibd This is the case number four. Eighteen-year-old boy present with the bleeding PR with the mucus since twenty-five to thirty days. So it could be quite infective or it could be a ulcerative colitis, and they have done the left-sided colon biopsy. So this is nice uh, low-power diagnosis of the uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, In ulcerative colitis, we see the mucin depletion in the crypt. There is a basal lymphoplasma cytosis, and there is severe cryptitis and cryptapsis. So this is a straightforward UC with the severe activity. What? How will you differentiate the acute colitis pattern? When there is acute colitis pattern, there is no significant changes of chronicity. There is no basal lymphoplasma cytosis, and crypts are aligned with each other. So we can almost easily differentiate from the infectious colitis versus early ulcerative colitis so now when there is ulcerative colitis there is a pan colitis then sometimes there is a ileum is also involved so that is most of the time is backwash ileitis but nowadays 
also if there is only left sided colonic involvement and see, still there are some ileal changes are there but there is no question for it maybe it's just a terminal ileitis maybe it is secondary by the infection so this is a backwash ileitis uh, we have a major role in ibd when there is a uh, suspecting a superimposed infection this is a very nice uh, cmv inclusion uh, these are, uh, this is very intranuclear endothelial cells is enlarged so intracytoplasmic and this is very nice CMV ISC. So this is also a UCV severe activity with superimposed CMV colitis. Now when there is a ulcerative colitis on a long standing, there is a question of dysplasia also. So this is a low grade dysplasia in IBD, this is a high grade dysplasia in IBD and sometime in a long standing you see there is an invasive adenocarcinoma can also arise. So there is a one entity inflammatory bowel disease indeterminate type. When we don't classify whether it is a UC or Crohn's, it's mainly a reserve for the resection specimen. And there is a question of indeterminate colitis when there is an appendicial patch, sickle patch, there is a segmental involvement. Sometimes there is a fulminant toxic ulcerative colitis, backwash ileitis. In ulcerative colitis, we commonly see the crypt ruptured granulomas. So if we mistaken as a microgranulomas, Loma of IBD, then case may be a diagnosed Crohn's also. So these are the all caveat by the histological changes. So I'm not going to detail in the mimics of IBG, but there are infectious cause can mimic the IBD, and a non-infectious etiology can also cause the mimic of IBD. So this take-home message: the histopathological examination of uh, endoscopic biopsy has a central element, as we so-called master blaster, to establish the diagnosis of IBD. Accurate and timely diagnosis is very important. Uh, so we just not help to diagnose the case. We also help to grade the activity and chronicity, and uh, also we diagnose the superimposed infection. So we have a definite role in the dysplasia also. Thank you, sir. Hello, now I, it's time for me to invite the radiologist, yeah. Dr. Deepak Patel from InFocus Ahmedabad. And may I please request all the speakers to confine themselves to the time limits because we have overlapping sessions. There are gastroenterologists coming from all over the country who have flight to catch. So please restrict yourself to the timings allotted to you. Over to Dr. Deepak Patel. Good morning. Uh, after elaborative talk uh, of Dr. Roma, I think I will, uh, you know, uh, I was just uh, thinking that I am the master blaster of uh, IBD. Uh, now uh, I will have to rethink, but still uh, I'll try, you know, uh, I'm not uh, trying to prove myself as master blaster because I am already. You know, <laughs> uh, but I'll just show you a few of the uh, findings which uh, only radiologists can see on, uh, you know, uh, for IBD diseases like uh, uh, initial university uh, that diagnosis as well as complications because nobody can see that complications uh, uh, even gastroenterologists uh, from inside the uh, lumen, uh, only radiologists can see uh, inside as well as outside of the lumen. So uh, uh, there are two entities, Crohn's and uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, to start with uh, imaging modalities, uh, there are nowadays uh, we advocate two imaging modalities like CT entrography or MR entrography. CT entrography as such, you know, uh, it is widely available because uh, nowadays uh, there are CT scan centers in each and every, you know, uh, even tier two cities also. Uh, even uh, we can diagnose IBD on simple CT scan abdomen pelvis also. But when there is a suspected case of IBD, or uh, when there is a known case of IBD, it is a proved IBD, then uh, uh, you have to ask for the entrography. Either it is a CT entrography or MR. Always MR entrography is, uh, has got you know better uh, uh, soft tissue uh, resolution. So MR entrography, whenever it is available, uh, it should be asked. But it requires uh, so much of expertise in terms of uh, doing the uh, that uh, uh, 
uh, techniques as well as reporting. So uh, CT angiography is always preferable. Uh, what are the imaging findings which we can see on a CT or MR? Are the uh, the enhancement uh, pattern, wall thickening, T2 mural signal intensity? These are the uh, MR findings, T2 mural signal intensity and restricted diffusion. Otherwise, rest of the findings which we can see on either CT or MR both, uh, ulceration, angos, vasa recta, skip lesions, seculations, restricted diffusion and fibro fatty proliferation. These are the primary uh, findings which we encounter on in the uh, case of IBD. So, uh, when there is an abnormal wall enhancement after administration of contrast in both active as well as fibrotic disease, uh, when there is a mural enhancement attenuation on CT uh, entrography, uh, which is increased compared to the uh, adjacent normal loop, it is termed as the uh, increased uh, uh, mural attenuation and uh, same way it, that uh, disease segment will show uh, increased mural signal intensity uh, on T2 weighted images. Uh, wall thickness is uh, 3 to 5 millimeter. Uh, is termed as mild disease, more than 5 to 9 millimeter is moderate and more than or equal to 10 millimeter is severe disease. But uh, there is a catch, uh, if the wall thickness is more than 16, 15, 16 millimeter, then it should not be termed as primary IBD, uh, which can be uh, disease other than the IBD or some superimposed uh, like uh, uh, malignancy uh, underneath the, uh, that uh, lying the malignant uh, disease also. So, uh, looking at the images, this is a CT andrography image. Here you can see the mural enhancement of the uh, terminal most ileum. Uh, another, th this is a normal segment and again you can see the uh, uh, contrast enhancement in this loop. Here you can see the contrast enhancement. So, in this single image, I can show uh, so many findings uh, like uh, there is a, a mural enhancement, there is a skip lesions. What is skip lesion? So when the, there is a, this is a disease segment, this is a disease segment, this is a disease segment and here you can see the uh, unaffected segment. So these are the skip lesions. Again one more uh, image of the contra, this uh, mural thickening as well as enhancement. Here you can see the transmural enhancement of the entire wall. Again one, uh, another segment of the disease uh, here loop which is showing enhancement. Uh, one more uh, uh, structuring uh, uh, segment. Here you can see uh, diffuse uh, involvement of the jejunal loops also. Here you can see the submucosal hypodensity the, which is because of the edema itself. Again uh, another uh, picture of mural enhancement with partial structure formation. This is, a T, uh, this is a MR image. Here you can see the hyper intensity on the uh, T2 weighted image. Uh, this, uh, this is a post contrast, sorry, and this is a T2 weighted image. Here you can see the uh, concentric wall thickening with mild dilatation of the uh, proximal loop. Then the, this is a T2, T2 mural signal intensity. Whenever there is increased bowel wall thickening with uh, mural T2 signal intensity, which is uh, low which is such so fiber, a fibrotic and when there is increase then it is an active disease. So on MR we can even differentiate whether the disease is active or subacute or chronic disease. So whenever there is low signal intensity it's suggestive of chronic disease, act, uh, high intensity suggestive of active disease. And most of the time, believe me, there will be uh, different stages of uh, disease activity. There will be some acute uh, segments will be there. There may be some chronic chronicity also, which may, are, may be going towards the fibrosis. Here you can see the uh, ulceration. This is a long segmental disease involvement with uh, diffuse concentric wall thickening. There are crypt formation and multiple hyperintense areas within the loop. Then the, again one more case of ulceration, here you can see the deep uh, penetrating ulcer. This is a long segmental diseased loop. Uh, these are the uh, MR images. On CT uh, uh, it is difficult to diagnose sometimes ulceration, but on MR we can definitely say uh, whether their ulceration is there or not. Then the uh, coming to the angos vasa recta. The angos vasa recta are what? Uh, they are the dilated blood vessels that supply and drain the inflamed bowel loop and that is because of the hypervascularity of the disease segment itself and which is known as the COM sign. Here you can see increased vasa recta within the entire diseased loop. This is the diseased loop which is you know showing mark uh, enhancement on post contrast scan and these are the blood vessels which are showing COM sign. This is the increased vasa recta. Then the skip lesions again we have seen I will just show you, uh, this is a disease segment, disease segment, in between there is a normal segment, normal segment and there is a disease segment. So these are the skip lesions. Skip lesions is again, you know, uh, the hallmark of uh, IBD. Seculations, 
seculations or pseudo seculation what is that so uh, whenever there is a mesenteric border inflammation or uh, fibrosis there will be secularization of the mesenteric border of the that uh, disease uh, lumen disease segment and uh, anti mesenteric border shows dilatation and uh, because of it is a non involved disease uh, that uh, uh, loop so that will show dilatation so here you can see there is a dis, uh, fibrotic segment of the mesenteric border of the bowel loop and anti mesenteric border they are showing dilatation or pseudo circulation then the restricted diffusion whenever there is a active uh, crohn's disease there will be restriction in the wall itself so here uh, you can see this is a t2 weighted image uh, t2 hyper intensity this is a diffusion weighted image and this is adc image this uh, a diffusion weighted image shows hyper intense signals and on uh, adc mapping it shows black so whenever uh, we see uh, hyper intensity on diffusion dwi and uh, adc mapping black that suggests there is a diffusion restriction and diffusion restriction comes whenever there is active inflammation even uh, in malignant cases also we do see diffusion restriction so isolated t2 weighted or diffusion weighted images cannot say the, uh, whether there is a disease, uh, active inflammatory disease only or um, underlying malignancy but we have to see in total like uh, t2 weighted t1 weighted then diffusion restriction then the post contrast uh, enhancement pattern everything we have to see in total then the fibro fatty proliferation is creeping fat whenever there is uh, mesenteric fat adjacent to the disease segment is hypertrophied Uh, which displaces the uh, adjacent structures and uh, that is called uh, fibro fatty proliferation or creeping fat here you can see the extensive fat proliferation in the disease segment this is a disease segment <coughs> again one more uh, disease segment of the colon where you can see the uh, fat proliferation and uh, creeping like uh, you know see the multiple fibrotic strands uh, surrounding the bowel loop itself these are the normal bowel loop there you can see the, the we can compare the fat uh, in the normal mesentery here and uh, the disease segment uh, this is the creeping fat <coughs> then the complications complications can only be seen by uh, ct and or mr entrography like stricture abscess fissure so uh, whenever <coughs> uh, there is a segment uh, which shows narrowing more than or equal to 3 cm with upstream dilatation then it is termed as the stricture because uh, we see we know uh, bowel loops are uh, definitely you know showing some peristaltic activity so whenever uh, there is a spasmodic segment we may not uh, term every time it is a stricture segment because because of the normal peristaltic activity also uh, that will be narrowed so whenever there is a uh, upstream dilatation proximal bowel loop is showing dilatation then and then we can term it as a stricture or otherwise uh, when it is uh, causing less than 50% luminal narrowing then it is termed as the luminal narrowing so stricture and luminal narrowing these are the a few cases where you can see the long segmental uh, narrowing uh, disease segment with narrowing again uh, this is a very good case where uh, we see the uh, fistula here it is a fistula communication between the uh, distal ilium and the sigmoid colon Uh, ulcerative colitis i think i will not go into the detail but uh, there are a few findings like uh, thickening of the intestinal wall mural edema ulceration loss of fossa mural hyper enhancement uh, this is a case where you can see the long segmental concentric wall thickening with loss of fossa of entire colon and prominent uh, uh, this uh, regional vasa recta so uh, whenever there is suspected ibd uh, we have to ask for either ct or mr entrography Uh, as per the expertise available in uh, local area uh, we can uh, see that uh, treatment response also on ct entrography or mr entrography and assess the complications so now thank you friends. pathologist and the radiologist comes the great endoscopist who will say that i'll have to see with my own eyes whether there is inflammatory bowel disease or not So over to Dr. Saurabh Kheria, who comes from Ames, New Delhi. Dr. Saurabh Kheria, please. मैंने मेल किया था. मेल में आया नहीं. कर दिया था मैंने मेल. आपका लैपटॉप है? हाँ, लैपटॉप. Please give me a laptop.
I think till setup done. Uh, we lots of times see the reports correlate clinically. So I think who is the master bastion we don't know, but histopathologist, radiologist, and of course the endoscopist has to correlate everything along with the clinicians. And very easy to diagnose IBD on uh, histopathology, but as a gastroenterologist, what we are facing the problem is to differentiate between TB versus Crohn's. So in that case, response to treatment after two months of any AKT or Crohn's disease, we have to keep the patient in follow-up. If patient is response to AKT, we should continue. If patient is not responding to uh, Crohn's treatment, we have to switch after re-diagnosis. No, no, we have given the treatments on the histopathology reports, but even histopathologists also can be wrong. They gave the TB and it could be a Crohn's. Yeah. Now over to Dr. Soram. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, sir. And my sincere thanks to Dr. Yogesh and his team for this opportunity. So now we have heard from the radiologist and from the pathologist about their role in the, the diagnosis of IBD. So what does, role does endoscopy play? Now, what do the guidelines say about the diagnosis of IBD? So a single reference standard for diagnosis of Crohn's or UC does not exist. So it's always a combination of findings, a combination of clinical, endoscopic, histological, radiological findings. So it's always a team effort. A single modal modality can never diagnose inflammatory bowel disease. So in this setting, let us see what does role does the endoscopy play. So endoscopy is always a gateway to the diagnosis of IBD and it's the first line investigation. Whenever we have a patient who has a suspected IBD, we start off with the endoscopy, we take uh, biopsies and then subsequently proceed on with the diagnosis of IBD. It also helps, up, helps us in uh, establishing the differential diagnosis, so differentiating between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and also between Crohn's disease and intestinal tuberculosis, especially in India. It also helps us in establishing the severity, which helps us in uh, deciding the treatment and also in prognostication in the patient and determining the long-term disease course of the patient. So, among the endoscopic modalities, allocolonoscopy is the first line investigation and is the investigation of choice. A few nuances about the allocolonoscopy for a patient with IBD. So, generally, for all patients, we should have a patient prepared optimally. Peglec is the choice and has been preferred over other agents by the guidelines. Uh, both low dose and high dose has been equally recommended and has shown similar efficacy. It depends upon the preferences and the center. And again, split dose versus stain preparation has, all, has been similarly endorsed. Important point is that the last dose of the preparation should be between 2 to 5 hours of the endoscopy or colonoscopy. Ideally, patients should be given conscious sedation with uh, benzodiazepine and opioids. And in the first or in the index colonoscopy, we should attempt to intubate the ileum because it helps in determining the extent and diagnosing the patient with either Crohn's disease or and excluding uh, and uh, also in uh, determining the differential diagnosis if we are suspecting a patient to have ulcerative colitis. What about the other modalities? So if a patient has a severe disease activity, in this setting, preparation and full length colonoscopy is usually not recommended. So unprepared sigmoidoscopy with biopsies is usually done for a patient who has acute severe colitis. Upper GI endoscopy is usually recommended in all patients with pediatric IBD. Upper GI symptoms, uh, for adults only if the patients have upper GI symptoms. A capsule endoscopy is usually recommended when a patient has a suspected small ball Crohn's disease with a negative ileocolonoscopy and a negative cross-sectional imaging. And a device-assisted inter endoscopy such as a double balloon or a spiral endoscopy is usually done in patients who have suspected small ball Crohn's and who have positive findings either on imaging or on capsule endoscopy and we want to take biopsies. Now, the second question is that is any endoscopic finding diagnostic of IBD? Well, yes, again, the guidelines say that no endoscopic feature is specific or is it pathognomonic for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. We'll all, we will always have differentials. And again, we have to see the clinical findings, the imaging findings to establish the diagnosis and to interpret the endoscopic findings on the background of these investigations which we have. It suggests that the features which are classical of ulcerative colitis include a continuous and a confluent colonic involvement starting from the rectum with a sharp demarcation. And for Crohn's disease, the useful endoscopic features are discontinuous inflammation, deep ulcers, strictures, fistula, and perianal involvement. Now, let us understand some of the terminologies which have been described by the ECO guidelines for endoscopy in IBD. 
so first of all, we start with the common findings of ulcerative colitis. So this is a normal colonic picosa showing the classical arborizing vascular pattern. So the first, first finding which we see in a patient with ulcerative colitis is the loss of this vascular pattern, which occurs because of the submuc uh, submucosal edema. So these classical vessels are lost, and there is some erythema and granularity of the mucosa. Now what about the bleeding? So again, two terms are described, friability, which is bleeding or intramucosal hemorrhage, which occurs after the passage of the endoscope, and a spontaneous bleed, which is seen <clears throat> when uh, before the passage of the endoscope, as seen here, there is some amount of blood on the mucosa and also some amount of blood in the lumen. Uh, about the ulcers, so erosion is simply a small defect in the mucosa less than 3 millimeter in size. Aphthous ulcers is a whitish ulcer with a reddish halo around the ulcer. And a, a superficial or deep ulcer is usually larger than the erosion. Now, these ulcers have also been graded uh, by and have been defined. So either according to the size or according to the, to the depth. So ulcer can be a small ulcer or a large ulcer depending upon the size. An ulcer can be a superficial ulcer when there is no border around the ulcer. And histologically, it is located, limited to the submucosa. And it can be a deep ulcer when it is a border. It is an edge around the ulcer. And usually, on histology, it is goes till the muscularis propria. And then again, the type of ulcer, transverse or a longitudinal. So transverse ulcer is usually perpendicular to the axis of the colon. And longitudinal ulcer is parallel to the axis of the colon. And then stenosis is usually when we cannot pass this group to the uh, uh, through the narrowing, it can be ulcerated or it can be a healed or a non-ulcerated structure or stenosis. And then cobblestoning, which is usually a feature of Crohn's disease, occurs because of deep linear ulcers with intermittent mucosal islands, seen as a crazy pavement appearance, and is usually is suggested or more characteristically seen in patients with Crohn's disease. Now, once we have done the endoscopy, we have noted the findings, we have seen what does the endoscopy say. So we need to take biopsies. Now it is recommended that biopsies should be obtained both from the normal as well as the normal segments. And now what about the number of biopsies? So this uh, was a recent study which showed that uh, uh, as less as two or three biopsies have a similar diagnostic accuracy as compared to four biopsies. So the guidelines also say for ulcerative colitis, a minimum of two biopsies for, from at least five sites around the colon should be obtained. And again, for suspected Crohn's disease, ileocolonoscopy and biopsies from the terminal ileum, as well as each colony segment should be done to obtain the microscopic evidence of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. After taking the biopsy, uh, we have certain endoscopic features which can help us in differentiating Crohn's and UC. So for UC, as suggested earlier, it's a contiguous involvement. Uh, in starting from the rectum, the ulcers are usually superficial and there is a sharp demarcation between normal and the abnormal segment. For Crohn's disease, there could be skip lesions. The ulcers are usually deep, they are longitudinal or we can find abscess ulcers as well. We can find strictures, we can find corbal stoning and we can also find small bone involvement and rectum may be spared in patients with Crohn's disease. A word about the endoscopic features between Crohn's disease and internal tuberculosis. So uh, CD is a multifocal disease, can involve both the right and the left colon. We can see after ulcers, we can see leader ulcers, and we can see cobblestoning. Uh, TB is usually a unisegmental disease, usually involving the ilocecal area and the right side of the colon. The ulcers are usually transverse, and we can have ilocecal involvement with the ulcerated and a patulous or a gaping ilocecal wall. Now, after determining and noting the endoscopic findings and taking the biopsies, we also need to determine the endoscopic severity. So how do we assess severity in patients with ulcerative colitis? So now what do we assess? So we look at, we look at these parameters. The degree of loss of vascular pattern, the degree of friability, the degree of bleeding, and the degree of ulcerations. Where do we assess? We assess the most severely affected area on sigmoidoscopy. And how do we assess? There are some endoscopic scores or indices which help us in determining the severity. So there are three common scores which are usually used in the clinical practice, the Baron, the Mayo, and the Ulcerative Colitis Index of Severity, or the UCEIS. So if we look at these three scores, loss of vascular pattern is assessed by all the three. Uh, Baron and Mayo look at the degree of friability. UCS does not consider friability. Spontaneous bleeding is usually assessed by all the three modalities. And Baron does not consider ulcers, whereas Mayo and UCS look, uh, consider the ulcers. So I look at the Mayo endoscopic score which has three gradings, MEO1, 2, and 3. So MEO1 is usually when there is mild inflammation in the home, mild erythema, mild friability, and the loss of vascular pattern. MEO2 when the erythema and friability is higher and there are erosions. And MEO3 when there is spontaneous bleeding and 
ulceration, superficial or deep. Mayo does not distinguish between superficial and deep ulcer. UCIS considers three parameters, the vascular pattern, the bleeding which could be uh, mucosal or luminal, and then the degree of ulceration could be superficial ulcers, erosions or deep ulcers. Let us see two examples of how do we calculate UCIS. So this is a patient of ulcerative colitis who has complete loss of vascular pattern, there is no mucosal or luminal bleed, and there are superficial ulcers. So he has, this patient has a UCIS of 4. Again in this case, the vascular pattern is completely obliterated, there is mild luminal bleed, and there are erosions, no superficial or deep ulcers. So this becomes a total of 5, so the, the patient has a UCIS of 5. How do we determine the endoscopic severity of Crohn's disease? So there are two scores used in clinical practice, uh, not so much in clinical practice but in clinical trials. The Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity and the simple endoscopic score for Crohn's disease. The two, they, the, both of them assess the similar parameters but in a differential way. So ulcers, uh, says CD usually assess the size, CDS sees whether the are, ulcers are superficial or deep, the surface involvement, uh, CDS scores in the form of uh, visual analog scale and it determines the percentage involvement, similar for the surface involved by the ulcer. CDS suggests whether the ulcer is ulcerated or non-ulcerated. Uh, the simple endoscopy score looks at whether the scope can be passed or not. And uh, so, say CD is um, more used in clinical practice because it is simpler to use than the CDIS. So this is a basic table which assesses the five segments of the bowel and looks at the size of ulcer, the ulcerated surface, the affected surface and the degree of narrowing. So to summarize, IBD cannot be diagnosed by a single modality, it's always a combination. Endoscopy is usually the first line investigation for the diagnosis of IBD. No endoscopic finding is specific for the diagnosis of IBD. The modality of endoscopy depends upon the patient's symptoms and the information from other investigations. And endoscopic scoring should be practiced for follow-up of these patients. Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers. And I think now is the time for us to decide who is the master blaster. But I think all of them have their equal role. Yes, and sir. to make the final pertinent statement, I have two gastrologists. Sir, for each, each IBD case, we bother Deepak Bhai and Roma Ben, always. <laughs> we have to bother them. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Chilapati. Yeah, so uh, great talks, all three of you. So the main problem that as clinicians we face is uh, the frequent reporting of non-specific colitis, non-specific duodenitis. So whatever findings that are shown like granulomas or, uh, you know, cryptitis, script, uh, script changes and all. And that is one problem. Second problem is there is no uniform standardized reporting among pathologists across the city, across the labs and across the, uh, 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 you know. So uh, still uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we rely more on endoscopic findings, though we know that uh, there are many non-specific findings and correlate with clinical and radiological pictures. Yeah. Dr. Chilapati Rao from Vishakhapatnam, for those who don't know the person. And now we have Dr. Dignesh Patel. Yeah. Uh, we have an overdiagnosis of uh, inflammatory, any bowel disease, because now CT maybe have a more severe sensitivity. So, non specific uh, writing of il ileocecal thickening. So, I think uh, we also should rectify it. And even now, we, nowadays, we are seeing more and more cases of Crohn's disease. I think it could be our diagnosis. Maybe now we are more aware of IBD, but still we should have specific uh, diagnostic criteria to define and s separate the non-specific entity of ileal ulcers and everything. I think now we will wind up or proceed to the next sessions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, all speakers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, chairperson. Now, the second topic is positioning different treatment in IBD and choosing correct doses. For that, I will request Dr. Chintan Kankara, sir, Dr. Vinkit Ayer, sir, Dr. Manoj Agrawal, sir, and Dr. Hardik Parekh, sir, as a chairperson. The speaker will be invited by the chairpersons. Now we call upon state Dr. Vinay Dahuja sir for the interesting talk on dose and uh, different treatments in IBD. 
Dr. Vinit Ahuja is a very senior gastroenterologist from Ames, New Delhi. He is a very renowned uh, person in inflammatory bowel disease in India as well as abroad and he has many publications on his name. The Afraj is also instrumental in forming all, almost all the guidelines yes. of, uh, for us. So it will be uh, apt to listen from him only. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I'm thankful to Yogesh, grateful to him for inviting me out here. And it's a pleasure coming to this meeting year after year. It's doing very well. So I'll be talking about positioning therapies in ulcerative colitis since there's another talk on Crohn's disease. So here I would concentrate more on ulcerative colitis. And I thought that instead of going through every part of it, I would touch things which I feel they are like minor points, they are caveats, they are nuances, which in day-to-day -day therapy we feel they are very important and we should be aware of them. Now there's a typical chart like that when you have a diagnosed case of ulcerative colitis, you would like to, if a patient has mild disease, you would like to start with 5-ASA and thereafter the patient has a severe disease, you move on to steroids and subsequently you can move on to biological therapy. Now often since there are so many therapies which are available for ulcerative colitis today, one is tempted to start with a higher-end therapy. Does it hold true for ulcerative colitis? Well, no. In ulcerative colitis, still the axiom is that you start with step-up therapy. You, in other words, if it is a mild disease, start with 5-ASA. Do not be tempted to start with higher drugs. If it is a moderate to severe disease, start with steroids. Do not be tempted to straight away start with biological agents. Second thing, in ulcerative colitis, regardless of whether it is the disease is involving the rectum, which is proctitis, or involving the left colon, or pancolitis, rectum remains the most predominant site of inflammation. So often when a patient comes with pancolitis, that is involving any extent beyond the splenic flexure, then one tends to give just 5 aminosalicyclic acids, so sulfur salazine, and ignores the rectum. The patient may continue to have symptoms, so even in a patient with pancolitis and left colitis, you need to give suppositories, you need to give enemas. If, you, if the inflammation is only predominantly in the rectum, that's a proctitis. They are giving liquid enemas is not going to help. Their suppository is going to help. If it is proctosigmoiditis, then you may add foam enemas. If the extent is beyond that and you want to control that inflammation, that is the place where liquid enemas will help. So it's always a combination of oral therapy as well as topical therapy. And I think topical therapy is almost mandatory in the induction phases for ulcerative colitis of any extent. And that often helps in taking care of many patients. We have two kinds of neosteroid preparations which are available. In general, earlier we have been using the systemic glucocorticoid therapy that is prednisolone, which we give generally in a dose of around 40 milligrams or something like that. And the benefit is that it has a very good action in terms of covering up inflammatory cells all across the body. But at the same time, it leads to a lot of side effects if given for a period of 12 weeks, 16 weeks, or even beyond that. Why? Because it's a therapy which is very cheap. At the same time, it is very effective. So again, if a patient cannot afford anything, you want to continue with that. So there have come up two kinds of therapies, that is a budesonide, two kinds of budesonide preparations, which offer the advantage of lesser toxicity. Budesonide has a very good first pass metabolism. Since it has a very good first pass metabolism, as a result, 90% of it gets metabolized in the liver, so the side effects are less. So we have one preparation which is known as the budesonide control release preparation. There's another preparation which has come up uh, known as the budesonide MMX preparation. Budesonide control release preparation comes where the dosage is 9 milligrams. You start with 9 milligrams. It comes in 3 milligram capsules. You get 3 capsules and taper off over a period of 3 to 4 months or you can even go up to 6 months. 9 milligrams for 8 weeks. Then thereafter you decrease to 6 milligrams and thereafter you go down to 3 milligrams. But remember that in which which situations would you give budesonide CR and in which situations you would give a budesonide MMX preparation? MMX is a kind of delivery system where budesonide gets released only in the, basically in the distal part of ILM and in the colon like. Mainly it is a colonic release system. 
So, if you are a patient of ulcerative colitis, there you would like to give budesonide MMX preparation because that gets released in the colon and ulcerative colitis affects the colon only. If it is a case of Crohn's disease where you want to check out inflammation in proximal ileum, distal ileum, then you can give budesonide CR preparation because budesonide CR gets released out there. And again, remember, they have a very high first-pass metabolism, so as a result, they would not be useful in other, other areas of the body, like if somebody has esophageal Crohn's disease or somebody has gastric Crohn's disease, their budesonide is not going to be useful. Another thing is that if you are going to use budesonide MMX preparation, it's again 9 milligram, a single capsule. But here, it's given for 8 weeks and you do not need to taper it off. In budesonide controlled release preparation, you taper it off over a period of 4 to 6 months. In budesonide MMX preparation, you do not need to taper it off. So the algorithm has changed a little bit. A patient with mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, you start with oral 5 ASs. Do add topical 5 ASs, even if it is written plus minus out here. Patient continues to be in remission. You can continue with 5 ASs and thereafter gradually taper off the topical 5 ASA. If the patient has partial remission, earlier the strategy was that you would add prednisolone. You would add 40 milligrams of prednisolone. But now you have another uh, point out here, that is you can add budesonide MMX and wait for the response for four to eight weeks. If there is no response, then you can move on to prednisolone. Another drug which is extremely effective and at the same time very useful in our country since it is cheap, it is, less, very, uh, it is not expensive at all, and that is azathioprine. Azathioprine is an excellent uh, immunomodulator. Azathioprine gets changed into 6 mercaptopurin and subsequently gets metabolized into 6-TG and where it acts with the mechanism of apoptosis. Now the interesting thing why I am showing you the pathway out here is that there are two genes which are important. The polymorphism of those two genes are responsible for the kind of side effects which are associated with azathioprine. The main side effect of azathioprine is myotoxicity, leukopenia, which can be so profound that it can be fatal in some cases. So there are two genes which are important. One is the TPMT and the other is known as NEVT15. And in general, we have always thought that TPMT gene was very important for azathioprine metabolism, but that seems to be true more for Caucasians. In Asians, it has been seen that NEVT15 is more important. So if you're going to start a patient on azathioprine, and if the patient can afford to get the polymorphisms checked, so it's always best to get send the patient a polymorphism for NEVT15 surely, and if possible, TPMT, and then you can start azathioprine at a dose of 2 to 2.5 milligram per kg. But often this is not possible. And you start azathioprine if you start as a happens straight up in a high dose, a patient has polymorphism, the patient would come with myelotoxicity, severe leukopenia, severe alopecia, and obviously subsequent opportunistic infections. So the approach is, one is that obviously the pharmacogenomic approach where you test for polymorphism. The practical approach is that you start with low doses. Start with 25 milligram or 50 milligram and monitor CBC every two weeks, after four weeks, eight weeks, and gradually build up the dose to 2 to 0.5 milligram per kg. That way azathioprine, you can avoid the side effects associated with azathioprine, that is leukopenia, the other is the hepatotoxicity. Remember that even though azathioprine is gradually is not being patronized so much in the western countries, when it comes to India, there is plenty of data which shows that azathioprine is a very useful drug. It has a long-term efficacy both in patients with ulcerative colitis as well as in patients with Crohn's disease, showing that retention rates and cumulative relapse-free survival rates of around 70 to 80%. Not only that, azathioprine has been associated with the risk of lymphoma, 1 in 10,000 risk. So because of that, often people feel afraid in terms of using azathioprine. Yes, there is definitely a risk, but that risk seems to be a little bit overhyped because if you look at data from India, then you find that even when patients are being given azathioprine for 5 years or they're being given for 10 years, the risk of azathioprine-induced lymphoma seems to be low. And if you are going to stop azathioprine within four years or something, patient is on azathioprine doing very well, and you feel compelled to stop azathioprine for the simple reason that you are afraid that he may develop lymphoma or some side effects may occur, remember that 
be careful about that kind of strategy because if you stop as it happened early, the relapse rate would be there. The relapse rate may be in the tune of around 50%. In fact, if you stop as it happened early, the higher the risk of relapse. So if a patient is doing very well on as it happened, maintained, then please do continue that and don't be in a hurry to stop that. We all talk about biologicals. You are aware that biologicals have become the cornerstone of therapy for IBD, and you have the anti-TNF biologics with the infliximab and adalimumab, which are available in the country. Come up, come up another biological that is a lymphocyte trafficking inhibitor, which basically prevents the lymphocytes from going across the endothelium and reaching the site of inflammation. The lymphocytes have a receptor on them, alpha for beta 7, and so if you have an alpha for beta 7 blocking an antibody that is known as vidalizumab, it will cause that. In the meantime, in the last one and a half years or two years, another very interesting molecule has come up. That's an oral small molecule. That's an oral agent. And obviously, the unlike biologicals, it need not be given by IV injection or something. And that is tofacetinib. That's a jack kinase inhibitor. Tofacetinib has been used in patients with psoriasis. Tofacetinib has been used in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And in IBD, again, it seems to have been, particularly for our country, I would say it has taken a little bit of it by storm. The reason being that <laughs> infliximab would attack only one cytokine, TNF-alpha. Vidalizumab would attack only one cytokine. That is, it will prevent the lymphocytes from reaching the site of inflammation. Whereas tofacetinib by virtue of blocking the cytokine signaling mechanism of the cytoplasm, so it will block multiple cytokines. Most of the inflammatory cytokines may get blocked, so it would be very useful. So if you compare, let's say, vidalizumab with tofacetinib, what are the advantages? You find that vidalizumab is good. It's a very safe drug, but the half-life is 25 days. It's going to take time to act. So tofacetinib is orally administered. It is an oral molecule. There is no immunogenicity. There is no antibody. It is easy to make, and that is where lies actually what I would say what has been the beauty of the situation that unlike biologicals, cis tofacetinib is easy to make, it's a generic drug, so the cost of tofacetinib is roughly the same cost as the cost of 5 ASA. So where you're going to give biological and the cost is going to be, let's say, 2 lakhs to 5 lakh rupees an annum, whereas tofacetinib, the same cost would drop down to just 50,000 rupees an annum, and efficacy-wise, for ulcerative colitis, the efficacy would be roughly equal. So, and one point about surgery. Surgery is curative for ulcerative colitis. But yet at the same time, I believe it still remains an unattractive option. The reason being that surgery, it's a two-step, and two-step also very few people do, and it is advocated that a three-step surgery should be done. And these three steps are spread over a period of one year. As a result, surgery becomes a little bit unattractive option, although it is curative. If the surgery was as simple as lab coli, I do not think we would have been talking about any such molecules. But here, the caveat is, is that if a patient is going for surgery, choose the surgeon carefully. A surgeon with good amount of experience would definitely pressure, benefit the patient much more. Another new molecule which is coming up uh, this week or this month is a blocker of IL-12 and IL-23 antibody known as a stekinumab. And this is an excellent drug, again, not only in terms of FAKC, but also in terms of being very safe. So what we realize is that if azathioprine and 5 are not working, we seem to have plenty of agents which are available out here. And as I showed you, the, there are plenty of agents, but I thought that I'll focus two or three slides more on tofacetinib because that is something which most of the people can afford. At the same time, it is efficacious, so we need to know one or two points more about it. As I told you, it's a multi-cytokine blocker. It can block IL-2, IL-6, IL-12, IL-23. What are the indications? It is useful mainly in ulcerative colitis. It has been uh, approved for second-line therapy after biological failure. If the patient is not responding to infliximab, vedalizumab, tofacetinib is the drug of choice. At the same time, as an off-label indication, it, is, it can be used for any steroid-dependent, steroid refractory, as a happened refractory disease. Note of caution out here. In terms of, we get very enthusiastic whenever a new medicine comes up. So most people jump the gun and start using it even when the patient has not been put on steroid or the patient has not been put on azathioprine. Remember, tofacetinib is efficacious. That efficacy comes with the cost. The cost is the side effects. You need to be aware of that. So do not be in a hurry to start that. Go through the step of steroids, azathioprine. Then you have a choice of biological versus tofacetinib. You can easily go in for tofacetinib. Extraintestinal manifestations are sort of colitis. That is ankylosing spondylitis or something. Can I take one or two minutes more? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir.
Thank you. So extraintestinal manifestations outside of colitis, tofacitinib would be very useful. Bedolizumab would not be useful in such a kind of setting. Acute severe ulcerative colitis, adalimumab would not be useful. Bedolizumab would not be useful. Tofacitinib or infliximab would be useful. Now, Crohn's disease. It is not based on phase three data. You can clearly say that it is not useful in patients with Crohn's disease. So do not use it in patients with Crohn's disease. You may have anecdotal cases. You may have some real world efficacy data emerging. But at the time point of time, use it only for patients with ulcerative colitis. There are other JAK inhibitors coming up, opadacitinib and all, which have been found to be very effective in patients with Crohn's disease. What is the dosage of tofacitinib? Induction dosing, 10 milligram twice a day for eight weeks. Thereafter, you decrease it to 5 milligrams twice a day, and again, you can give it for years. You don't need to stop it at one year, two years, and three years, or something like that. Two side effects you should be very well aware of, because these side effects do occur, and they can be a little dangerous. One is when you're giving induction dosing of 10 milligrams two times a day, there can be thromboembolism. There's a high risk of thromboembolism. So any patient who has a previous history of thromboembolism, do not give tofacitinib. And this kind of side effect mainly occurs when the dose is 10 milligrams twice a day. The other is herpes zoster reactivation. That is fine. If it occurs, generally you are able to get the patient recovers well most of the time in such situations. Other other regular side effects like cytopenias or hepatotoxicity, but these are the two side effects which one should be aware of and one should monitor for them. If a patient has a hepatic disease, renal disease, you need to decrease the dose by 50% and you need to screen for tuberculosis before you start for tofacitinib because tofacitinib also may lead to reactivation of tuberculosis like infliximab. One has to be careful for it. So I'll quickly run through a case study just to show you that, okay, now what is the gamut of options which are available for ulcerative colitis and how you can position your therapies. Like, for example, this gentleman was followed up in PGI in 1975, and he was symptomatic in 1975 and subsequently had bloody diarrhea, urgency, no features of, uh, no EIM diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. He came over to AIM somewhere around uh, 2019 or something because he was doing very well for 20, 30 years on sulfasalazine, and he was on clinical remission thereafter shifted to five years, uh, doing very well. Somewhere around this decade, last decade, he started having relapses, put on steroids, put on azathioprine, but required multiple courses of steroids. So the, clearly the situation was that you had to move to the next line. The next line is infliximab or adalimumab out here. So when he was asked, that at that time only infliximab and adalimumab were available, the patient refused adalimumab because he ran infliximab because he was around 75 years old and he thought there's a risk of infection and he did not want to go for those drugs. But the situation was such anemia hyperalbuminemia, anorexia, weight loss, a high fecal calprotectin. We'll talk about fecal calprotectin in the case discussion. So what would you do in such a kind of situation? Well, there are multiple options which are available, but I think the first thing one should remember is that patient has 30 years of disease, pancolitis, severe inflammation, root of colorectal cancer. Because colorectal cancer can occur commonly in patients with ulcerative colitis or even in patients with Crohn's colitis. So instead of stepping up the treatment, always look back and see whether your diagnosis is correct, anything superimposed has not come in. So the patient was screened for malignancy, was found to be fine, and thereafter the patient was, was decided that patient was given these choices, infliximab, bedolizumab, surgery and all. Amongst these choices, particularly in a setting if its patient is elderly, prone to infection, what would you like to use? This is the kind of setting where all of them may be effective, but the most effective would be vedolizumab, or the most safe would be vedolizumab, because it's an elderly man, prone to infection. So, Vidalizumab is a safe drug. As I told you, stekinumab is coming up. That has as good safety data as vidalizumab. So any one of them can be used in such a kind of setting. The patient was given vidalizumab. He did very well for four to five doses. Uh, subsequently, again thereafter, he went into a relapse. Now you have so many choices available. So you can position your therapy. So you had a choice. What are you going to do next? Again, offer anti-TNF, go for colectomy, stekinumab, tofacitinib. What are you going to do? Ustekinumab is still to be launched, so you have three choices actually. So the patient opted for tofacitinib. Why? Because he felt it was so easy to take. Why, why not I take like two, two uh, 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 tablets a day? It started on tofacitinib, given induction dosing, followed by maintenance dosing. He continues to do well. He's doing well. If he has a relapse now, what will he do? If he has a relapse now, we can give a stekinumab because a stekinumab seems to be as safe as vidolizumab. So uh, in, uh, if you have a patient with steroid-dependent ulcerative colitis, no response to as a happened, you can give 
or give any of these choices. Although the first line therapy would remain infliximab, vedolizumab, or surgery, or even like tofacetinib if the patient cannot afford biologicals. If the patient is prone to infection, you can give vedolizumab or ustukinumab. If the patient has extra intestinal manifestations, and remember out here, you can use infliximab or tofacetinib or ustekinumab or adalimumab. The rest of the two choices may not be practical. So to end it all, you have a plethora of choices which are available today and you can, if you use them judiciously, you can really make the life of a patient of IBD comfortable. Thank you so much for your attention. Excellent lecture, sir. We are lucky to have you. Uh, say, is there any questions from the house? Uh, sir, just about the uh, herpes zoster prevention. So, is the vaccine really available? Because uh, so the recombinant problem, only the varicella vaccine is available. So, is it enough? And uh, whether we give that, what should, what is your protocol? So, it's a live vaccine one. So, if you have to give it, then you have to give an interval of four to eight weeks before you start with tofacetinib. Often that is not practical. Best is to give a recombinant vaccine. The recombinant vaccine is not available in the country, but as I heard yesterday, somebody was telling me that it is getting launched very soon. So, if it is available, then you can easily give the recombinant vaccine and start simultaneously tofacetinib. Uh, till that option is available, you have to give a time interval of four to eight weeks. Or you can also check if there's been previous history of varicella or herpes previously. If that has been there, then probably the patient already has antibodies and should not develop the infection. Sir, uh, what's your take on uh, in acute uh, flare of ulcerative colitis? Uh, so, uh, uh, role, role of tofacidinib in acute flare. So we'll be discussing that in the case discussion, but to put it briefly, tofacetinib has been found in case series to be effective in patients who have failed IV steroid therapy in acute severe ulcerative colitis. The dosage should be 10 milligram three times a day for three days, and thereafter you can step down to 10 milligram twice a day. But yes, it has been found to be effective at our center also. We have been using it for many patients. When many patients, I said 10 or 15 patients, and around 50 to 60 percent of them did get a good response. Sir, do you think that tofacetinib Tofacetinib will come up in the management algorithm like fire assay, tofacetinib, and then other uh, molecule. No, it will not come up. It will be a very good option. Like it will come up is in the sense that it will be used much more than biologics. For example, when opadacetinib comes up, it is available. That tofacetinib starts acting in three days earlier, so maybe three to five days. Opadacetinib acts within one day. It is useful in ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease. And if it is generically available, then obviously everybody would like to go for that rather than go for biologics. Gradually, the world is going to move towards oral small molecules or subcutaneous biologics. Okay. I think, I think Any I questions from the audience? Yes. Radhika. Last question. Uh, very nice presentation, sir. Uh, you. In your talk, you have mentioned that Vidolizumab has a slow onset of action. So in case of severe UC, should we overlap Vidolizumab with a steroid miss or what? Because in severe UC, no, in acute severe ulcerative colitis, you would not like to use vidolizumab. In general, the rule of thumb is, yeah. worldwide, I think this rule of thumb is followed. If there's an inpatient, do not use vidolizumab, whether it's a case of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, where you want inflammation to be controlled rapidly. If it's an outpatient, yes, you can use it. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairperson. Next topic is, can diet influence inflammatory bowel disease? For that, I would like to invite Dr. Shreya Putala, ma'am, Dr. Ajay Chauksi, sir, and Dr. Jignesh Patel as a chairperson. The speaker will be invited by the chairperson. For this topic, we will be inviting Dr. Partha Pal from AIGM Hyderabad. This is a topic on can diet influence inflammatory bowel disease. 
as most of us who are managing our patients in the OPD, you know this is a frequent question, what should I eat and what should I not eat? Good morning, everyone. So, uh, the, today's morning I shall discuss, can diet influence inflammatory bowel disease? So, this is a uh, very common question faced by the physician treating inflammatory bowel disease. The doctor, what should I eat and what sh uh, should I not eat? And often, because we do, the doctor may not have actual idea what to do, there is insufficient evidence or they remain silent because of the busy practice and give, or give some non-specific advice. They go into internet, WhatsApp, then family and friends and alternative medications and we lose the opportunity to treat these patients. So that's why diet is so important. At different stages of inflammatory bowel disease, it has a role in prevention of inflammatory bowel disease treatment of IBD flare, uh, prevention of flare. In IBD complications, it has a role like stenosis and also surgery. There is a role in pre perioperative management, management of malnutrition and sarcopenia, and also it may have a role in decreasing the risk of malignancy. So the pathogenesis of IBD is, there are many four factors, mainly genes, environment, gut microbiota, and immune system, in which diet is the main, environmental factor which acts via the gut microbiota to alter uh, the uh, gut microbial profile which leads to change in the, uh, uh, which is called diversity of the bacteria in the gut and dysbiosis and which leads to, uh, which can lead to IBD. So this is the uh, picture of her uh, illustration of healthy gut in which you can see fibers and starches which uh, there is lot of short chain fatty acid like butyrate which acts on the their receptors and these are the different layers that is uh, there is eubiosis, there is mucosal layer, the mucin layer is preserved, the uh, epithelial layer is preserved and there is harmony between the regulatory T cells and the uh, pro-inflammatory cells. In Crohn's disease, what happens there is dysbiosis, there is loss of butyrate, short chain fatty acids, thin mucus layer, then the breakdown of the tight junctions and bacterial translocation which ultimately leads to inflammation. Similarly, it uh, happens in ulcerative colitis as well as there is also additional role of sulphide reducing bacteria which is also known as colitogenic bacteria uh, in this apart from uh, what is common with Crohn's disease. So these are the things which are risk factors and protective against IBD. Regarding the fat, high fat diet, trans fat that is, you, that is there in, if you use similar, uh, same oil for cooking again and again, that's why we have, uh, try, uh, tell the patients to avoid outside food. Omega-6 fatty acid, whereas omega-3 fatty acid is pro protective. Red meat increases the risk of inflammatory bowel disease, whereas fish, as specifically fish oil is protective. And carbohydrate, refined sugars and artificial sweeteners, they actually produce mucin degrading bacteria. That's why it is increases the risk, whereas complex carbohydrates like oats may be protective. Practice of no breastfeeding and uh, maybe uh, increase the risk of IBD, whereas vaginal delivery may be protective because it acts on the gut microbiome. Then processed and uh, frozen food increases the risk of IBD, whereas natural food is protective. Meat-based diet is, uh, increases the risk, whereas fruits and vegetables is protective. Among the vitamins and minerals, uh, titanium dioxide, which is present as a, used as a preservative, can increase the risk of inflammatory bowel disease and is being implicated more often now. And also two uh, vitamins and minerals that I want to stress is zinc and vitamin D. You can supplement zinc as well as vitamin D. You can supplement in your patients. It has been seen if the level of vitamin D is more than 40, then uh, the immunogenic effect, you can get the advantage of the immunogenic effect. Alcohol, whiskey increases the risk, whereas red wine in moderation can be protective. So these dietary factors act on the uh, gut barrier as well as the immunity. It acts on the mucosal layer, gut permeability, uh, regulatory T cells and intracellular pathways. Also it acts through the microbiota acting on the uh, dysbiosis, also the metabolic products produced by this bacteria which is the metabolome, the virulence of the bacteria and also mucosal adhesion and translocation. I am not going into details. And this is the mechanistic action of diet in IBD. Dietary fiber actually increases uh, this fecalibacterium, uh, eubacterium, which is beneficial for the gut because it produces short chain fatty acid. Dairy products should not be, uh, uh, we should not tell the patients that we sh you should avoid dairy products if there is no lactose intolerance because it is beneficial in terms of, because it produces bifidobacterium lactobacillus, which protects against pathogenic bacteria. 
whereas artificial sweeteners and uh, refined sugars, they increase the ruminococcus species, which are mucin degraders and which affect the gut barrier integrity. High intake of red meat is associated with increased enzyme uh, in the bacterial virulence and produce production of toxins which destroy intestinal epithelium. Crucifers vegetables like uh, uh, your cabbage, cauliflower, this actually this is controversial. This increases the production of hydrogen sulphide, that is sulphide reducing bacteria which can increase the risk of uh, ulcerative colitis. But it can also act on the uh, contrary on the aryl hydro hydrocarbon receptor which is a part of the anti-inflammatory diet for ulcerative colitis. So this is some interesting result from our gut microbiome laboratory and in which uh, we have seen that if you are giving more of vegetarian diet uh, and uh, if you are giving non-vegetarian diet, there is a relative uh, increase in the fecal bacterium which is a butyrate producing, uh, producing bacteria in the vegetarian diet. So based on uh, the microbiome profile, you can uh, tell the patient what to take and what not to take. So this is the era of personalized dietary therapy. And as you can see, dietary fiber is important, especially from fruits and vegetables. 24 gram per day is important. Soluble fiber, fruits and grains uh, should be advised. Then vegetables and fruits, as you can see, fruits and vegetables, they decrease the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. Long-term milk intake, especially red meat, can increase the risk of IBD. Usually, if the relative risk is more than two, then it is significant. Uh, chicken, as you can see, more than thrice a week. So in moderation, less than one or two times a week, you can advise in your patients. Then long-term high fat intake, as you can see, omega-3 fatty acid is uh, anti-inflammatory, which is present in medium chain triglyceride and fish oil. You can recommend this, and specifically in coconut oil, which is used in Kerala, as well as uh, in olive oil, whereas omega-6 fatty acid, which is pro-inflammatory, that is present in mustard oil, soybean oil, uh, saturated fats, and milk fat, which can increase the risk of ulcerative colitis. Also, there is increased trans fat also can increase the risk. Gluten, there is insufficient evidence to recommend restriction based on RCT, but it can cause ileitis in the mouse model. Many patients self-restrict and they feel better. That's why this uh, sometimes self-restrict and uh, they feel that there is reduction in the flare. And uh, actually, we should redux, uh, reduce this in the flare because it can be immunogenic. Then regarding the milk, lactose intolerance is common. Is in, it is present in almost 70% patients. Self-restriction is uh, there in almost two-thirds. And restriction actually can cause calcium and protein deficiency, especially in vegetarians. In a country like India, that can be detrimental. And actually, if there is uh, there's no lactose intolerance, they can actually tolerate milk up to 240 gram per day, as shown in a randomized control trial. Pro-inflammatory, it is pro-inflammatory, pro-motility and increased gut permeability, so its use should be uh, uh, monitored and excluding milk is not routinely recommended, it is the grade A level 1 recommendation. So this is a study from our center which is submitted to ECO this year and we compared the different the dietary risk factors for ulcerative colitis and as you can see we found that non-vegetarian diet, soft drink consumption and fast food consumption increased the risk of UC although the odds ratio was not more than 2, only odds ratio that was more than 2 was daily fast food intake and bakery consumption in the multivariate analysis which is more prominent in the case of Crohn's disease. It was not that prominent like uh, the odds ratio of smoking. Risk of malnutrition, this is a study of uh, um, uh, nutrition student that we have done in our center. As you can see, the risk of malnutrition is higher in case of uh, Crohn's disease rather than ulcerative colitis, maybe because small bubble is involved. Also, the sarcopenia may be there in almost half of the patients. And as, uh, the point here I want to highlight is active IBD, there is increased risk of malnutrition compared to those who are in remission as uh, shown by different indices. Diet as a therapy, exclusive enteral nutrition, uh, it is often given as tube feeding through nasojejunal or nasogastric tube for six to eight weeks followed by par uh, partial enteral nutrition, but it is poorly tolerated, so that's why there is shift from en exclusive enteral nutrition to Crohn's disease exclusion diet, the more of whole uh, food-based dietary therapies for induction of remission, and it was shown as, as effective as induction of remission in Crohn's disease in pediatric patients. It, the foods which are excluded in CDED are processed food, alcohol, coffee, gluten, saturated fat, red meat and dairy products. So there are different formulas, elemental formula which consists of mainly amino acid, medium chain triglyceride, but the osmolarity is high, the patient may have GI intolerance and diarrhea. Semi-elemental formula contains oligopeptides and other starch and simple sugars apart from glucose polymers along with medium chain triglyceride, uh, the uh, osmolarity is lesser. We can use polymeric formula because it is uh, cheaper and uh, can be well tolerated as well. 
protein you should recommend giving a patient 1 to 1.5 gram per day more if the patient is having uh, active disease legumes vegetable proteins and fish fat low fat diet mct based olive oil you can they can use for cooking carbohydrate easily digestible cookie, cooked rice based fermented grain fruits and vegetables can be tell uh, advised Active disease avoid the trigger factors uh, uh, depend on patient's uh, gut uh, uh, gut's instinct as well. Exclusive enteral nutrition can be used for pediatric patient and there is emerging data on adult patients as well. In remission, assess the nutritional status, correct deficiencies like vitamin D, zinc. Treat uh, irritable uh, even in the remission they may have irritable bowel like syndrome. In those patients, low FODMAP, gluten free diet or milk free diet may be helpful. In stricture, in the presence of stricture, low residue diet without insoluble fiber can be used. So this is another uh, a whole food based dietary therapy which is called CD treat which excluded high fiber food, alcohol, gluten and lactose and it also showed that it was effective in induction of remission Crohn's and this is the patient uh, adult study which also this is from Israel which showed that it is uh, with or without partial enteral nutrition Crohn's disease exclusion diet was helpful in mild to moderate Crohn's disease in induction of endoscopic and clinical remission. This st uh, study from AIMS which have shown that fecal multi-donor fecal microbiota transplant with anti-inflammatory diet followed by anti-inflammatory diet alone was effective in inducing and maintaining remission over one year in mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. They avoided gluten, dairy product, processed red meat additives and refined sugars and added more of fresh fruits, vegetables, fermented foods and cruciferous vegetables. So then uh, there is another randomized control trial from AIMS which showed that exclusive enteral nutrition in acute ulcerative colitis it increased steroid responsiveness and uh, duration of hospitalization as well in these patients. So this is the AR, uh, uh, international organization of IBD guidance to control and prevent relapse in IBD. Uh, the similar things that I have already discussed. So can healthy diet prevent IBD? This is the data uh, of more than 83,000 patients and which actually showed that adherence to Mediterranean diet can actually prevent later onset Crohn's disease. This is a, a very large trial which showed it can actually prevent and can help and this is another study from Ashwin Anantakrishnan group which showed that uh, the diet which is having the in high inflammatory pattern uh, like uh, more of red meat and um, high sugar refined sugar that can increase the risk of Crohn's disease as you can see the follow up is uh, very high more than uh, 5 lakhs person years. So is there a common denominator in, in all these diets? Yes. So uh, most of these diets avoid dairy products, lactose, emulsifiers, then uh, processed food sulfides as you can see. Sulfides can uh, also introduce in anti-inflammatory diet. So there is subtle difference between the same but there is, uh, there is a common string between these different dietary therapies. So uh, they, how do they act? As you can see Mediterranean diet that increases the microbial diversity, increases the butyrate production, short chain fatty acids, the mucin layer, it, uh, it preserves the mucin layer, it, uh, it decreases the gut permeability and also is anti-inflammatory when acting on the lamina propria. So just uh, one minute more. So diet based on disease activity in severe disease you can use the exclusive enteral nutrition. In moderate disease you can use cross disease exclusion diet. In mild disease you can use specific carbohydrate diet and uh, in remission you can use a Mediterranean diet or a FODMAP diet. This is also you can uh, shift from one diet to another the Mediterranean diet then you can wash out and then go into specific carbohydrate diet. They uh, actually metabolomic analysis have shown that they act on this autophagy uh, pathway and uh, act through this NR, NRP3 inflammasome. An ideal pouch that is created after ulcerative colitis surgery this is a man-made model of IBD in which actually it has been shown that fruits and vegetables and probiotics that decreases the risk of pouchitis in future. So this is a model of uh, development of IBD because already the colon is removed in the ileum this disease develops in that also fruits and vegetables were shown to be protective. So also this diet acts at multiple levels like microbiome, metabolome that, that is the metabolic products by the microbiome, division proteins, transcript uh, then epigenomics and genomes. All this data is actually leads to a very big data which is uh, phenotypical data should be collected and the future is for personalized dietary recommendations in inflammatory bowel disease. So what are the take home message? Proteins, fish and poultry and avoid red meat, carbohydrates, use jaggery, complex carbohydrate fruits and vegetables, don't are refined, don't refined sugars, fat, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid, use olive oil, coconut oil, uh, avoid high fat, saturated trans fat, mustard oil, soybean oil, 
food, natural food, avoid processed food, outside food. You should assess the patient nutritional deficiencies and then correct them. And um, trigger food you should avoid and small amounts can be given in remission. Trust the patient's instinct rather than going by the books always. Amount, small amount in time so they should take, they should avoid NSAIDs. Uh, zinc, vitamin D and B12 supplementation can be done in specific cases. Red wine in moderation have shown to have a uh, protective role. So diet, my question of the talk was whether diet can influence IBD. Yes, diet can influence IBD. Diet and microbiome play a role in IBD pathogenesis as we have seen for the Western and healthy diet. Diet can affect the microbial composition and fact function and can rapidly alter after, mi uh, after multi-omics interaction. Microbiota targeted dietary interventions can be used to treat and prevent inflammatory bowel disease. Exclusive enteral nutrition in Crohn's disease is helpful in pediatric patients and is equivalent to steroids. In adults, it is inferior to steroids. In ulcerative colitis, it increases the steroid responsiveness. Patient satisfaction and personalization can improve the outcomes of microbiome-directed dietary interventions. If you want to know more, then you come to our conference next year. Thank you so much. This was a nice talk on a subject we uh, really read much about, uh, but due to less time, we'll be shifting on to the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Chairperson. Now we have a case-based panel discussion. Topic is patient with chronic diarrhea, weight loss, and PR bleed. For that, I will invite Dr. Rupa Banerjee, ma'am, Dr. Vinita Ahuja, sir, Dr. Gaurav Chawla, sir, and Dr. Saurabh Mukhiwar, sir, as a panelist. Dr. Chela Pati Rao. Dr. Chela Pati. Dr. Chela Pati. Dr. Chela Pati Rao, sir. Good morning, and uh, so we have a case discussion which I hope would have something for everyone, for the postgraduates, for the physicians, and for the ivory treating gastroenterologists also. And we have, uh, I would say, a galaxy of panel out here, all luminaries. And I'll start with the case later on. So we have a 22. The case is a 22-year-old girl who was symptomatic with two months of history onset in April 22. Loose stools four to five per day, bleeding per rectum, cramping abdominal pain, weight loss 10 kgs. That's the kind of history which we have out here when a patient comes with this kind of history. And this is something which you may see commonly in your clinics now. It's not an uh, uncommon occurrence anymore. So my first question is to Dr. Rupa Banerjee. What are the common cause of crop? chronic diarrhea with poor rectal bleed. How would you analyze this case history? What do you think would be the causes of chronic diarrhea with poor rectal bleed? I think we need the, yes, this is the, uh, f the first thing. And when you see, say, chronic, uh, most of the infectious causes actually go out. So, I mean, when there is, the, uh, the trouble comes when the patient comes, with an acute attack. And that is the time when you have to think of the infectious causes more. But uh, when there is a chronic diarrhea amongst the infections, I would say tuberculosis is what we have to keep in mind first. Uh, the, rarely there could be you know, chronic granulomatous conditions like your senior and all which are undiagnosed and then they persist for longer uh, uh, duration. Other than that, there are some sexually transmitted diseases. These are all rarer causes in, amongst the infectious. Amongst the non-infectious, of course, we are discussing inflammatory bowel disease, and I think inflammatory bowel disease will be the first. Additionally, we should also rule out whether there is a, a history of a chronic NSAID or, a, you know, uh, painkiller abuse, which can cause small bowel 
ulcerations, can cause sometimes crampy abdominal pain and diarrhea, whether there is any history of any radiation and things like that. So these are all history dependent. When you see the ulcers, there wouldn't be any difference. But the non-infectious causes, particularly use of these aspirin group of drugs, as well as the painkillers, also has to be kept in mind. Basically, how do you it. classify, would you call it a large bowel diarrhea, when do you call a patient as having, because the causes would go according to the anatomical localization. Yes. So when do you call a patient like, has yeah, large bowel diarrhea? Yeah, 15 to 20, here we are thinking of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, no, but how would you call a patient as having large bowel diarrhea or a small bowel diarrhea? Like for the interest of the postgraduates, if you could just pick up major points like, when do you call a patient as having large bowel diarrhea or a patient having small bowel diarrhea? Because the causes would vary according to that. Yeah, I think uh, you are right. I mean, uh, if there is this uh, multiple, the frequency is so high, then you tend to think of the large bowel, more of crampy abdominal pain, uh, small amount volume, that will go in favor of uh, small bowel uh, disease. Okay, so basically, as Rupa says, so that's basically, it, this is the kind of algorithm you would follow because it is not only for postgraduates, it's for everybody in practice. Set of a decide, more than four weeks, less than four weeks. More than four weeks, chronic. Is it functional or is it organic? Anybody with blood in the stools, anybody with weight loss, anybody with fever, you know that it is organic because the commonest cause of chronic diarrhea remains IPS, which is functional. So we rule that out. Then we decide whether it is large bowel diarrhea or small bowel diarrhea because the causes are going to be based upon that. Acute diarrhea, as I said, acute diarrhea as we told you all infections, chronic. It's not only IBD. Think about colorectal cancer. Obviously not in a 22-year-old girl, but 22-year-old girl, remember, may have FAP for all you know, familial adenosis, polyposis. Diabetic colitis in a slightly elderly group, colonic TB, ischemic colitis. These are the other causes which you should think of. And this is how you differentiate between small bowel diarrhea and large bowel diarrhea. This is not purely, purely theoretical. It is something which I find it very useful in day-to-day -day OPD when you are dealing with all causes of diarrhea. A small bowel diarrhea, the volume would be large. Essentially, there may be malabsorption. The person will give history that they are passing no stools and the amount they are eating. There will be no blood in stools. There will be no rectal symptoms. There may be presence of steatorrhea or flatulence or protein malabsorption. Large bowel diarrhea, there will be blood in the stools. There will be rectal symptoms. What are the rectal symptoms? Urgency, frequency, tenesmus. Besides that, there will be pain which would be below the umbilicus. In small world diarrhea, the pain would be periumbilical. So these are the major ways by which you can differentiate between these two and depending upon them, then you can subsequently go on to the causes. Now this patient was chronic large bowel diarrhea because she had chronic diarrhea more than four weeks of duration. She had organic symptoms, so it was non-functional. She had blood in the stools. The stools were small volume. There were rectal symptoms, so it was large bowel diarrhea. So she was thought since because of her age and subsequently she was subjected to sigmoidoscopy. Sigmoidoscopy suggested that there were large ulcers in the descending colon. Pseudo polyps were there, although it was a first time presentation, luminal blood was there, but at the same time it was slightly not totally fitting into ulcer to colitis, so a CT abdomen was also done, which showed that there was long circumferential mural thickening which was involving the uh, rectum and sigmoid. In morning you had a radiology talk where Deepak told you that CT enterography has to be done in such patients and I fully agree with that. In such a kind of case where you are thinking about large bowel, there a positive contrast has been given. Otherwise remember that any suspected IVD case, do a CT enterography or a MR enterography, do not go in for a positive contrast CT. That is another thing which often many of us end up making that mistake. So, so now this is a question for you. Here there are certain things which are not fully fitting into ulcerative colitis, but at this point of time, do you need to differentiate ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease in terms of further management? Do you think that you need to really put them in a silo of that diagnosis straight, uh, fully like? Yeah, it's a, so I, at least in terms, we, we're clear that here there's an inflammatory bowel disease and this severe inflammation patient is symptomatic. So this patient will require immunomodulators and therapy for suppressing the inflammation. Now, uh, there are subtle points where it's important to understand if it's Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. A lot of it has to do with the prognostications and what to expect. Uh, the therapy more or less will be similar. 
for example, monitoring. Right? So when you're monitoring any of these patients with Crohn's disease, we are also concerned about the small bowel and other gut involvement, which you'll not expect with ulcerative colitis. So we won't bother with cross-sectional studies. So that would be relevant if we could classify. Sometimes we cannot, which, you know, as best as you can try. Uh, second aspect is going to be medications for treatment. Generally, for uh, ulcerative colitis, topical AS agents work beautifully for mild to moderate cases. I have a school of thought where I do not see the utility of topical AS agents at all in Crohn's, but I'm sure there are other thoughts uh, as well for that. So the type of medicines used, like topical AS agents, you cannot use for Crohn's is, is my thought one. And uh, some therapies are approved for UC, uh, some biologic-wise. But those like golimumab and stuff are not available in India, so it's not of much practical relevance in that sense. So, initial, lastly, yeah. so initial therapy you would say would remain the same regardless of whether it is True. Crohn's or ulcerative, because you would like to give steroids, you would like to give yeah. 5 ASA and all, yeah. so that is something. But I think ultimately the surgery will matter, because if you are doing... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a very important point which Saurabh is saying now, and you need to really concentrate on this. Yes, yeah, Saurabh, can you elab elaborate on this point? This yeah, point? so I think uh, ultimately if a surgical intervention is required, it is desirable to know if it's UC or Crohn's because if you're performing a surgical intervention for Crohn's, so something such as an ileorectal anastomosis is acceptable because patients um, may not have rectal involvement. But for ulcerative colitis, uh, it's not an option. So you're doing total proctocolectomy with ileo allele pouch in anastomosis by creating a, a new pouch. And that's, uh, that's an important factor because patients who are thought to be UC but have Crohn's and have undergone ideal pouch have seen recurrences in their pouch as well. But, so that's sort of the yeah. difference. I think so the basically be. what Sir was told us is that yes, you may have confusion, but generally if you look at the table, most of the medicines which you use for ulcerative colitis are also effective in Crohn's disease, except cyclosporin is not useful in Crohn's disease, methotrexate is not useful in ulcerative colitis, and tofacetin we discussed in morning is not useful in a patient with Crohn's disease. So which is fine. Your initial management will not change at all. What is going to change is subsequently if the patient requires surgery. Surgery is curative in ulcerative colitis. In Crohn's disease, surgery is followed by recurrence almost invariably or up to the tune of 80%. In ulcerative colitis, you're going to make an ileal pouch anal anastoposis, whereas if in the case of Crohn's disease, you end up making a pouch, the chances of pouch failure would be very high. So if you are planning, if the practical point out here is that if you're not planning therapy, uh, surgery, then therapy remains the same. If surgery is planned, then in the first step, once colectomy has been done, then you can sit down with the pathologist and the pathologist can be the master blaster in that setting and decide, okay, that this patient has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or indeterminate colitis and thereafter you can plan the second step surgery. So, again, this is another kind of setting. Let's say the history was only four weeks. The patient has a history of two to three weeks, bloody diarrhea, a lot of diarrhea, and looks like large ball diarrhea. And the patient comes to you in the OPD, and you're not able to decide whether this patient has acute infectious diarrhea or the patient has IBD. So, God, like, how, would you, uh, how do you think we should approach in such a setting? Sir, in such cases, as uh, your physicians as that we can give straight away antibiotics and take how the patient is responding. So, if it's not responding in 10 days, symptoms are persisting, then we may consider endoscopy and see what, what are the lesions, take biopsy from them, and then biopsy will tell if it's acute infection, we'll get neutrophilic inflammation. If it's UC, we'll get cryptitis, crypt abscesses and stool cultures also may help. So these biopsy features will tell, solve the problem, but initially we can give antibiotics also and for 10 days and take how is the response. If it's acute infectious colitis, most of them will resolve. So the thing is that, I'll come to you, so the basic thing is that you need to look for one or two histological changes. Crypt architecture destruction takes three to six weeks to appear. That is the main histological landmark for IBD. But prior to that, there's another change which can occur and that is basal plasmocytosis and basal plasmocytosis can appear as early as two to three weeks. So if you find this histological change, you know you're dealing probably with a case of IBD, but generally you need a good pathologist, a good GI pathologist to document that. So the, uh, what I would say, the practical point is that give a course of antibiotics as Gaurav said, repeat a sigmoidoscopy after two to three weeks again. Initially you may not have done a sigmoidoscopy and it's always best to have one or two sigmoidoscopy before you make a diagnosis of UC because it's a diagnosis for life. 
Do not be in a hurry to make a diagnosis just on the basis of one sigma otoscopy. Sometimes patients are very sick, so you have to start steroids even after one sigma otoscopy. There also repeat a sigma otoscopy later on and confirm the diagnosis. And so repeat sigma otoscopy and biopsy is the key. Sir, can I ask you one thing? Yes, in my experience, one such case came and we labeled at UC based on uh, biopsy, but subsequently you have find that our pathologists may also sometimes be in a dilemma what to do later and repeat sigmoidoscopy after 2-3 months there was no changes of UC. So I was also surprised in that case because initial biopsy was suggestive of you see, so you have such experience. So, so again, so in 1986 or something, Dr. B. S. Anand from Jeepan published a paper very short with Shigella. There was crypt architecture destruction. So even with acute infections, you may have crypt architecture destruction which may occur. But coming back to this case, I would still wait for one year and go back and see because even after one year, the patient may, patient would have initial therapy. What happens initially, the inflammation subsides. And then one year later, they may again have a resurfacing of inflammation. So I would keep the case open. Yeah. No, I would like to ask you a question regarding this antibiotics. I mean, it's a much discussed thing. So if, if this patient was an ulcerative colitis or it's the first attack, would you give antibiotics if there is no fever, no other symptoms? Okay, we'll come to that question later when we develop acute severe ulcerative colitis. Yeah, right? So that's the question. So you in acute severe ulcerative colitis, Rupa's question is, do you give antibiotics in every case of flare of acute ulcerative colitis? The major response is yes, people end up giving. But most of the times it is not so useful because opportunities of infections may be to the tune of 10 to 20 percent, not more than that. So there's fever, there's leukocytosis, there's abdominal tenderness, there's toxic megacolon. There definitely you have to give antibiotics. Otherwise they will not be so useful. Okay. Now, Dr. Chalabati, for you, there's a new test. There's a test, I won't say new test, but a test which is we are getting exposed to. It's a slightly expensive test also, fecal calprotectin. When would you use this kind of test? Where is it useful? Yeah, at least uh, in this case, it is clear cut that it is inflammatory bowel disease. So there is no diagnostic dilemma. But uh, we can use this test for as a follow-up. So get it baseline before start of therapy and maybe repeat it uh, over a period of time because it has good predictive value to uh, predict the future recurrences or relapses. And also when it is uh, coming down, it indicates that the treatment, the patient is responding. So if there is a, especially if in, in case of diagnostic dilemma, if it is a chronic diarrhea, yeah. non-bloody. Dilemma between what, IBS and IBD? Yeah, uh, like a non-bloody diarrhea. So uh, if it is a chronic non-bloody diarrhea, IBS versus IBD, then it is it has a diagnostic role. But in this case, it doesn't have any diagnostic role. It can be used as a, a monitoring tool and uh, to, to, to predict the response and relapse. So, uh, for diagnosing, particularly if the patient does not have such kind of florid symptoms and you're confused the patient has irritable bowel syndrome or IBD, then you can use fecal calprotectin. That is something, the protein which is released from the cytoplasm of lyse neutrophils. So, whenever there is inflammation, you will get calprotectin high. In amoebic colitis, you'll get calprotectin high. In tuberculosis, you'll get calprotectin high. In IBD, you'll get calprotectin high. But in a case of irritable bowel syndrome, you will not get calprotectin, which is high. In microscopic colitis, you may not get calprotectin, which is high. So there it is useful as a diagnostic test. And subsequently, in a well-established case of IBD, as Chalapati said, that if you want to monitor the response, you don't want the patient to undergo repeated sigma otoscopies. The patient is doing well, however, you are not very sure whether the ulcers have healed inside or not, and you do not want to subject the patient to sigma otoscopy, do a fecal calprotectin, and by the values of fecal calprotectin, protectin, you can go ahead and decide, right? So this patient was diagnosed to have acute severe ulcerative colitis because she had more than six bloody stools, she had anemia, ESR, CRP was high, and so we have various indices which were talked about in the morning, the endoscopic index and all, and uh, abdominal X-ray was done which showed a lead pipe colon, although there was no toxic megacolon, toxic megacolon is more than six centimeters dilatation of transverse colon, Colonoscopy showed these kind of deep ulcers, not very characteristic of ulcerative colitis, I would say, but at the same time, yes, there are a lot of, lot of inflammation. So, Ruba, now, the, what would you do in such a setting? So, uh, acute severe ulcerative colitis, what do you think should be the first-line therapy in this kind of patient? I think this answer is simple. I think the first-line uh, therapy will be intravenous steroids. 
and uh, I think I'll keep yes, it that. Many of, our, many of us are physicians out here, so if you can be more elaborate in terms of what is a dose, in terms of which steroid do you use, what dose do so you use? So you can use hydrocortisone also, and you can use it uh, entirely. If need be, you can even go up to um, six hourly, and uh, that will be the first choice. If the patient has got what we need to saying that the cal of this um, white blood cell count is high, there is some fever, and there is some tenderness in our setting, uh, we normally would add some antibiotics, but as such, antibiotics will not have a definite role in acute severe ulcerative colitis. And then you watch. So the initially you have to do a scoring, then see how severe the patient is, monitor very closely. By 72 hours, if there is no response, you have to get in your surgical colleagues as a standby, plan for rescue therapy, and throughout this period, discussion with the patients and patients' attendants is extremely important because this is one situation where the surgical team and the medical team have to work in tandem side by side. Okay. Okay. So, thank you, Rupa. So, basically, steroids, antibiotics, and Partha talked about exclusive enteral nutrition, which can also be tried in these settings, and you always give thromboprophylaxis. This is something we forget because these patients are predisposed to thrombosis, and uh, you monitor their response. As Rupa told you, by day three, you have to be very clear whether the patient is responding or not. And so, this patient uh, was subsequently also two things you have to remember that you have to look out for two infections apart from the regular parasitic infections we talked about. When you do the sigmaroscopy on day zero, you always take a biopsy for CMV because CMV decides the natural course of acute severe ulcerative colitis. You take a biopsy, you can do an immunohistochemistry strain or you can do a real-time PCR in the biopsy if that is available. So, and second is send the stool sample for Clostridium difficile. These are two infections you would like to check up. So, in the morning, um, uh, uh, this, uh, the CMV was slides were also shown and it has been seen that a high CMV load, more than 2,000 copies, seems to change the natural history of acute severe ulcerative colitis, predisposes them to colectomy. So this patient had CMV, was started on gancyclovir, steroids were continued. You're not going to just stop steroids suddenly just because the patient has acute severe ulcerative colitis. The patient was by day six partial responder. This is again a repeat sigmoidoscopy which shows that the patient is partially responding. Now the question is what to do now. So the, blood, the patient has been given IV steroids, had a partial response, has been treated for with IV gancyclovir. Now what are you going to do next? What are the options available? Yeah, I think uh, in this particular case, the interesting part is that well, well, Maybe you can ask the audience first and then you can give the answer. So how many of you would like to give infliximab in this case? You can raise your hands, please. One. <laughs> okay. How many of you would like Five. to give cyclosporin? Okay, they're still there too. Vidolizumab. Okay, none. How many surgeries? Surgery. Surgeons. Okay. Tofacetinib. Okay, top of the infliximab, they're both equal. Over to you, Surab. So, so, I think in this particular case, the, the thing that's throwing off is the presence of CMV. And uh, I think typically in a standard patient, say if there was no CMV, we would be considering infliximab as a primary choice as a second line therapy. I don't know in the context of uh, control CME with Gansaiklu, we probably still would consider. So the options really essentially have evolved and are true in Fliximab and Cyclosporin. Uh, I don't see Nebulizumab playing a role in acute setting. Uh, Tofacitinib as well not playing a role in acute setting. Surgery, yes, that uh, the surgeons can debate and would. Uh, you know, most surgeons would probably want to operate. But um, infliximab or cyclosporin are your two options. Typically, the dosing, if you're giving infliximab, is 5 milligrams per kg. A standard dosing is 0, 2, and 6 weeks. However, uh, we have realized over time that a lot of these patients actually eventually undergo surgery. So they say 40-50% by the end of one year with infliximab dosing eventually get surgery. So now there has been a trend towards a more tailored approach with an accelerated dosing, 
which has reduced the rates of collecting in future. But that's sort of evolving field. Cyclosporin is something else that can be considered. I don't have much of a personal experience because we go to infliximab as I go to therapy. But it's about 2 milligrams per kg. And that was the early study which showed uh, some medicine beyond steroids and acute severe colitis with cyclosporin. Remarkable results early on, but people haven't really used it much. So this is exactly what Saurabh has told you. These are, you can use any of these agents if you want. The maximum experience is with infliximab and cyclosporin. Surgery remains a great option. Now I think we have time for just one question. So Gaurav, like, we have another similar kind of case. Diarrhea, pain, abdomen, fever, weight loss. Here, there's a kind of setting for Crohn's disease. And as discussed in the morning, the closest differential to Crohn's disease in India is intestinal tuberculosis. So briefly, can you tell everybody, how do you differentiate in a patient where you have done biopsies, where you've done colonoscopy, you're not very sure whether the patient has tuberculosis or Crohn's disease. It's the first presentation. What are the various, what is the algorithm to follow in such a kind of setting? So, so if you have, uh, history will also tell us initially, there is a in tuberculosis, you will have a shorter history. Maybe we can go through this slide. That would help. Like, so patient uh, features favoring Crohn's disease. As uh, sir has told, endoscopically there will be multiple segments will be involved in Crohn's disease. Usually more than four segments are involved in uh, Crohn's disease. We'll have uh, longitudinal ulcers will be there in Crohn's disease. Whereas in tuberculosis, usually we have a transverse ulcer rather than the longitudinal ulcers. Biopsy, if you say microgranuloma will features very important in Crohn's disease, but in tuberculosis, caseation is a very important presence of acid fast bacilli is important, large granulomas are important. If you have contiferon TB gold positive, it is very important. In radiological features, the features which is more important, most important TB is necrotic lymph node is most important for tuberculosis. Where in uh, in uh, uh, CT entography will show long segment involvements, small bowel involvements in Crohn's disease, increase of visceral fat in Crohn's disease and that, that's how we also do sir, chest x-ray is also important baseline things we should not miss baseline chest x-ray we always order to that may give a clue whether TB is there or not. So just to add to our order of like what we feel maybe others can think about it is that CT chest we have found to be particularly useful in this setting when trying to differentiate tuberculosis and Crohn's disease and you can do the CT chest couple it with CT enterography only so that will not add to another separate investigation uh, IGRA in Indian setting has not found to be useful Gaurav is very right when he says IGRA is useful, but that is more in an Asian setting than the meta-analysis. In Indian setting, still the data is there. And finally is that when you do every all of this, and still you're not very sure, you go ahead with an anti tubercular therapy. So when you give anti tubercular therapy, so then that case, earlier the thing was that you give anti tubercular therapy for six months, and watch for symptomatic response as well as mucosal response, both. Not only symptomatic response, that will not help. But since ATT may be disposed to structure formation, so best is to look at 8 to 12 weeks in patients where you are not sure the patient has TB or Crohn's. Where you have AFB positive, KZ in granuloma positive, there you are very sure. You don't need to do at 8 to 12 weeks. Wherever you are not very sure, then 8 to 12 weeks because you look for not only symptomatic response, look for mucosal response. 30% of patients of Crohn's disease may respond symptomatically. Remember that it is mucosal response which has to be coupled along with that. That will help you in making a diagnosis. And uh, Chalapati, any final comments on this algorithm or I would say like uh, colorectal cancer, one line on colorectal cancer. Should patients of ulcerative colitis be screened for colorectal cancer? Yeah, yeah. Actually, studies have shown, in fact, from AIMS as well as Asian studies, meta analysis have shown that we also have the equal risk as uh, other Western population if they have IBD, leave about the sporadic cases, but IBD related colorectal cancer, yes, they need to be screened depending on the high risk or medium risk or low risk. So we usually start uh, colonoscopy for colorectal cancer screening around 8 to 10 years after the uh, initial diagnosis and then depending on the findings and risk, we keep on doing the okay, yeah. okay. Thank you, thank you very much. I think in shortage of time, uh, we won't have any more questions. Thank you, thank you all of you for coming up with a nice discussion. Very pertinent points. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Chairperson. Next topic is IBD in India, Real Life Challenges. For that, I would like to invite Dr. Hardik Gupta, sir, Dr. Misa Patil, sir, Dr. Radhika Chavan, ma'am, and Dr. Gyanbar Singh as a chairperson. The speaker will be invited by the chairpersons.
So our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Rupa Banerjee, ma'am. She is from Asian Institute of uh, Gastroenterology, Hyderabad. And she has a vast experience in inflammatory bowel disease and today she is going to talk about IBD in India, real life challenges. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. First and foremost, I must thank Dr. Harwani for inviting me to Ahmedabad. Beautiful city. I like the drive uh, yesterday night. Uh, and um, it's a good gathering of all of you for a So what we'll talk today is what are the real life challenges for IBD in India? So if you see traditionally IBD was a disease of the West. We did not have much IBD in our country but today it is a global disease and across the developing world you are seeing more and more cases. It's all the yellow that you see. It is where there is an increasing incidence. So it is a story of an emerging disease. We published this paper on more than 10,000 patients across 25 countries. And what we are seeing is everywhere in this part of the world, IBD is increasing. It is affecting the active age group, the age group in which people have to build their social life, their career, and we are seeing increasing number of pediatric IBD as well. These are chronic lifelong diseases. They have long-term complications, may require multiple surgeries. There's growth retardation in children. There's an increased risk of colorectal cancer. There is fear, there is stigma, and there is suffering. In this situation, what are the India challenges? We are a happy, large population. Our challenge is IBD is not even considered a public health problem. There are no true population-based registries. If I ask you to raise your hands, all of you would have seen some IBD at some stage all the time. But then there is no registry. There's limited access to healthcare facilities. We don't know what is happening in the villages. There is poor physician awareness of the disease. All bloody diarrhea is over-the-counter amoebiasis treatment. And then, of course, it's overlap with other infective diarrheas and tuberculosis. So what are the main few focus areas that, where there are challenges? One, in the diagnosis, where there is TB and Crohn's. Number two, everybody is doing colonoscopy these days. Any small ulcer which is not TB is considered to be Crohn's disease. Is it really so? Do all these ulcers need treatment and lifelong treatment for Crohn's disease? How should we treat? We don't have multidisciplinary care here. There are problems which are associated with IBD which we overlook. Then the balance between cost and cost effectiveness. What if a patient cannot afford what we are writing? How do we deal with that? Second, we are following Western guidelines all the time. Our IBD may be different. Why is this increase? Can we prevent it? What about access to healthcare awareness? So these are all areas which in our part of the world becomes important. Infectious diseases remain big killers in the developing world. And if you see this extrapolation of data, it will still, though it is coming down, even up to 2030, what we will see is there will be a 45% still issue of infectious diseases persistent. There are different infectious mimics of IBD, which we just discussed, bacterial infections, sexually transmitted diseases, parasitic diseases, the amoebiasis, and all of that. And then there is the tuberculosis factor. So TB is one of the most common infections in India, and 30% of the global burden is in India alone. We are using biologics, which may flare up latent TB. 
90% of infected patients are actually having latent tuberculosis. So there are hazards of IBD therapy in a TB endemic region. Together with it, look at this. You cannot differentiate by looking at an ulcer, is it TB related or is it Crohn's related? And if you thought anybody can help you, no. Clinically, of course, they're similar. Radiology looks same. Endoscopically, they look similar. And the histopathology is the same as well. Even the pathologist will tell you there are granulomas, could be TB, could be Crohn's. And what is happening? Because of diagnostic delay of Crohn's disease, the increased incidence of stenosis, need for surgery at a delayed and a delayed diagnosis. Only 45% of patients are diagnosed by one year. Number of patients, 30% receive empirical anti-tubercular therapy. At least two to three physicians on an average are seen before a confirmation of the diagnosis of Crohn's happens. So this is what is real life for our part of the world. And the problem is so real. We have this patient, you know, she came with abdominal pain. So it's not that even if you know, it may be difficult to differentiate. She was having what we lose motions, occasional low grade fever. There was mild, there was multiple white based ulcers in the ileum. We did a CT enteroclysis, multiple segmental wall thickening looking almost like Crohn's disease. In view of the long history, imaging colonoscopy typical of Crohn's, we started bidicinide, mesalamine, steroids did not work, and we thought we had to go for infliximab. A chest x-ray was normal, TB quantiferon normal, uh, negative, Bantu negative, no family history of tuberculosis. <coughs> Before giving the infliximab, we did another colonoscopy. And that time, the TB-PCR came positive. This was from the second biopsy specimen. We started on a four-drug ATT, and there was, she was better with more than a nine kilo weight gain. So the lesson we learned is that it's not easy to say, well, yes, it is Crohn's or it is TB. We have to do all the tests available and then take a calculated decision. Otherwise, with biologics, there may be disaster. There may be spread and disseminated tuberculosis. Patients on infliximab, anyway, there is a risk of increased or, you know, tuberculosis, as you see in this real-life data and studies which have been published from uh, India. Dr. Vineet is here and Dr. Puri's group. So this is what we are seeing. Empirical therapy anyway has its limitations. We are giving without thinking, but sometimes we have to give because we cannot decide. So what we normally do is we make a plan based on all the tests, if everything looks Crohn's, start treatment in the line of Crohn's disease and follow up at two months. Similarly, if things look like tuberculosis, give treatment for two months and then follow up. Follow up, follow up, follow up is extremely necessary and keep an open mind. There's no scope of thinking, well, I thought it is TB and it is TB. It may not be. So despite all, we have to be careful. And then at two months, by that time, your TB culture is completing, you're seeing the patient response, complete therapy. If culture is negative, patient not improving, rethink, redo the tests. If culture negative, but the patient is improving, complete therapy. In general, it may be worthwhile to complete TB therapy for at least six months if you have started. Because of the future, you should know that you have completed one full course of anti-tubercular therapy. Are all terminal ileal ulcers Crohn's? Now, this is a story which has gone back to ages. And if you see here, in 1936 also, they thought, what are these ulcers? that on every colonoscopy you find a few of them and then you feel okay. And the patient gets worried, well, I have Crohn's disease, does a doctor Google search which tells them now Crohn's disease is a lifelong chronic disease, may develop cancer. They may not be. So this is one thing we have to keep in mind before we initiate high-grade treatment. What we did was we checked the microbiome of these patients. 
Uh, we check the microbiome of Crohn's disease, terminal ileitis, and healthy patients. And what we are finding that the gut microbiome is actually different. The dysbiosis is significantly higher in Crohn's disease compared to these um, non-specific ileal ulcers. So there are predictive metabolic pathways which we have seen. Bacterial stress response is higher in Crohn's disease compared to terminal ileitis. So we have to be careful when we are doing this treatment. Not all terminal ileal ulcers are Crohn's. Non-specific cases occur and a follow-up is all that is needed for such cases. What about treatment approach? We should see that there should not be under treatment because it will risk increase the risk of complications and hospitalizations later on and we should not have over treatment because it has the cost and as I said every terminal ileal ulcer does not need expensive treatment the risk of other adverse events so this is another thing that we have to stratify the risk if it's a young patient with an extensive small bowel Crohn's disease do not wait start the best start the biologics early so step up therapy, yes, in general. Top down, difficult in our situation, but we have to stratify the risk and take a decision. An accelerated step up in current day is the best because when there are other so many options available, we should not deny the patient if the patient is not improving. Early biologic use based on risk factors. If there is initially high dose of steroid requirement, age is less, there is presence of perianal disease, extensive small bowel disease, pediatric age group, if the growth is hampered, then he, will ne he or she will never get it back. As a teenager, that is going to be a major issue. In such situations, it pays to use biologics. If you see this patient pre-infliximab, post infliximab within eight months on his birthday and he shared these photographs for me to share it with the world and today he runs a successful channel so this is important that you give the right treatment at the right time position your treatment according to the need of the patient sometimes for the cost benefit to facetinib as dr vineet mentioned early to facetinib may be a better option uh, because it is oral and cost effective. IBD is a multi-organ disease, needs a multidisciplinary team and for all the gastroenterologists and physicians here, we should not think that we know everything. We always feel we are the one with the ladder for every inflammatory bowel disease, but that is not true. Now if you see these pictures, these are complications of IBD. Can we define or differentiate between them? This is episcleritis, this is scleritis, and scleritis needs emergency or urgent uh, treatment. Otherwise, there might be visual loss. Episcleritis, not so. Early pyoderma, if we do not treat it, it will become the late pyoderma, which responds poorly. So we need all our colleagues. Fistulizing Crohn's disease needs the surgeon, needs the seat on placement, the drainage if it is needed, together with our treatment. So this is another challenge in India where we feel we can do everything, and but for IBD, we need a multidisciplinary team. Then there are other overlooked issues. You know, we forget about mental health. As long as the number of motions are okay, we feel that, well, you are fine. But that person may be suffering from mental illness. He may be having sexual health issues, which is very important to him. But what do we do? We feel, no, that's not our domain. And in India, that's very important. In the IBD Emerging Nations Consortium Group, we conducted a survey. And what we found was that depression was very high. Not only the patient, the caregiver, high Zaredbaran in index. So high caregiver burden also was noted in more than 67% of patients. This is from nine countries. The story appeared similar. Navigating sex in IBD, as I said, it's often a taboo area. Many are afraid to ask and actually suffer in isolation because if you forget about the biological factors or psychological factors, many of the drugs 
can also cause sexual disturbances. So for all patients, we need to actually do a quality of life, mental health, sexual health screening, which in India is never ever done. What about cost and cost effectiveness? We know that most of our patients have no insurance and paying out of pocket. So what should we do when the best is unaffordable? Use immunomodulators, use surgery. Sometimes limited resections are better. We should have an exit strategy for biologic therapy. We should look at low cost alternatives, biosimilars. Sometimes I feel we need more research on all the complementary alternative medications which are available. We use as a thioprine, though the Western world often says it is not useful because it works. And it works for our population. Judicious surgery for often, most often, that is cost effective. For biologics, most of our patients will ask, can we stop biologics? Are they effective if restarted? So the Western world, the Western eyes, they will say, go for all this, check for deep remission, then decide what is the ideal candidate, somebody in clinical endoscopic histologic remission. But in reality, what happens in India, de-escalation happens because there was no money. And then, we have to ask them, why did you stop? Why did you miss the dose? Any complications, any side effects, any alternative medications, and how are you now? And then take a decision on what treatment to give. Can biologics be discontinued? We have actually studied more than 300 patients who have stopped biologics. What we find is actually there is a significant percentage of people who can be okay for even up to two years can be restarted later on, and that works. So we always have to discuss on a patient-to-patient -patient basis whether the biologic is worthwhile to be continued. We have to do a cost-efficacy analysis and then take a call. Otherwise, the patient will never, ever be compliant. So we need to discuss right at the outset what our plan is for the biologics. There is a subset of patients who do sustain long-term revision of therapy after stopping biologics. That is the future for research. Our IBD may be different, as I just mentioned. We are genetically, environment-wise, microbiome-wise, different from that of the Western world. But we follow Western guidelines. Why? Because data from this part of the world is rare. So we need our data. We formed the IBD Emerging Nations Consortium, and in this paper we found that our IBD is different. We use 2.4 gram of mesilamine, and it works. We use azathioprine, we need lesser dosage. All our disease parameters are different, and I think we need to keep that in mind when we are working together. There are additional concerns. I'll just quickly brush past. Our rural part never gets attention. So we had this, our AIG IBD Rural Outreach Program, which we are currently running. And what do we see? We are doing a door-to-door -door survey for IBD and GI diseases across the Telangana, around the Hyderabad districts. What we are finding? We are seeing symptomatic patients at a local camp in the village or the panchayat office doing their ultrasound, giving them, we are doing mobile door-to-door -door endoscopy every week. We are finding that infectious diseases is on the decline in the villages. There are no diarrheas. IBD is on the rise. GERD, obesity, metabolic disorders are all on the rise. So, an emerging IBD in rural India is what we are seeing. So the reason appears to be there. Increasing urbanization. Look at this picture of a village store with all the fast foods and chips being displayed heavily. Can we prevent it? So this is the reason I would like all of you as physicians also to join this group, www.ibdenc.org the Emerging Nations Consortium. So the key message is optimize treatment, understand the unique challenges in diagnosis and management in India, personalize treatment based on what your patient needs, and of course for India we need a socio-economic adjustment of treatment. 
how correct that is ethically correct that is we don't know but we need to do it this is our team at uh, aig hospitals and once again as partha mentioned do come to attend the aig ibd summit 2023 7th to 9th april thank you thank you very much ma'am uh, because of uh, time constraint uh, we have to conclude this session thank you thank you thank you everybody thank you ma'am and thank you chairperson next topic is the big based management of steroid refractive ulcerative colitis for that i would like to invite dr anil kul shrestha sir dr bhagirath solanki sir and dr venkat ayyer sir the speaker will be invited by the chairperson so steroid refractory ulcerative colitis is a big challenge and it is always a tussle between the gastro physician and the gastro surgeon and both have its it's it's a very controversial topic and both have its ad distinct advantages and disadvantages so we will first uh, call our uh, gastroenterology medical gastroenterology uh, side team <laughs> and dr sarab kedia we already heard from him this morning and he is going to speak on uh, can surgery be avoided in steroid refractory ulcerative colitis uh, thank you sir so uh, moving on uh, with the uh, session on steroid refractory ulcerative colitis the question here is can we avoid surgery so let us just look at acute severe ulcerative colitis uh, we all know it's defined by the two lobes and bits criteria in the presence of six or more bleeding stools with uh, any of the following anemia fever tachycardia or raised esr or crp so it's a medical emergency which requires hospitalization and time bound management and it's always a joint effort a multidisciplinary management and a close collaboration between the physician surgeon and we always forget but also the patient so patients decision patients interest and patients uh, uh, output is always uh, very important in the timely decision making on of these patients now a uh, quick overview of the management all over the for a patient with acute severe ulcerative colitis so patient has a baseline assessment with the routine investigations x ray stool for c diff and a sigmoidoscopy and biopsy for cmv patient is started on intravenous steroids at day 3 we assess the response most commonly with the oxford criteria with stool frequency and crp so patients who respond are switched to oral steroids by day 5 and discharged on azathioprine patients who have been complete response again assessed at day 5 and if they show response they are again switched to oral steroids and for non responders by day 5 we label them as steroid refractory ulcerative colitis so if we look at the uh, short term and the long term outcome of the patient with acute severe ulcerative colitis so overall uh, 25% of patients with ulcerative colitis will develop asuc 10% would develop it as an index episode 30 to 40% of these patients would be steroid refractory as we discussed earlier and 10 to 15% would undergo index colectomy and in the long term overall 30% would undergo colectomy 60% would have relapse and 30% would develop a repeat episode of acute severe ulcerative colitis so now coming back to the question in steroid in a patient with steroid refractory acute severe colitis can surgery be avoided so now why does this question arrive first of all why do we need to avoid surgery and if we need to avoid surgery what are the options for surgery so if we look at this study which looked at the quality of life after uh, uh, ipa or the ileal pouch and anastomosis then most patient were satisfied with the choice regardless of the procedure whether it was proctocolectomy with ipa or with endoscopy the most of the improvement was because of the control of disease related symptoms and the withdrawal of all the immunosuppressants and more than 90% patients reported improvement in the quality of life so it can be said that surgery cures the disease and it is and is associated with the good quality of life now we look at the other side of the coin so these are two studies which looked at 
the uh, outcomes more than 20 years after uh, collectiving these patients with uh, ulcerative colitis. So 93% had functional pouch at 30 years, but the 20 to 30 year cumulative probability of complications such as pouchitis was in, seen in more than 50% of patients, strictures in about one third, which led to obstruction in about 30 to 40%, fistula in 15%, and pouch filler in about 15 to 20% of patients. If you look at the hist uh, systemic, systematic review on outcomes, then among the short term outcomes, up to 20% patients will have any infectious or any complication. And among the loud com outcomes, again, up to 40% patients may develop complications such as pouchitis, stricture, or any other complication. And what about other complications? Fertility, which is a very important issue for young females. So, ILL pouch and anastomosis surgery or a collective for ulcerative colitis is associated with reduced fertility rate. And in this systematic review, we see that up to 10 years of follow-up, the risk of infertility was about four times higher than the general population. Although laparoscopic surgery has led to the re uh, reduction in the incidence rate, but it still is a quite high proportion of patients who develop infertility after surgery. Now, what is the difference between outcomes of elective and emergency surgery? So, if we do a patient for acute uh, surgery for acute patient, severe ulcerative colitis who is refracted to steroid, it would be an emergency surgery. And this uh, meta-analysis looked at the outcome between elective versus emergency surgery. And the post-operative mortality was significantly higher when it was emergency colectomy when, versus when the colectomy was done on an elective basis. So, is surgery really a cure for UC? So we can say it's a troubling cure for patients with ulcerative colitis and also though colectomy cures you see but it leads to other diseases such as pouchitis and other complications. Now coming on to the and this, uh, other aspect is the patients. So we, as we discussed earlier it's a multidisciplinary approach with the patient, surgeon and the physician. So what does the patient want? So this is an old study which looked at the patient preference when we did not have multiple options for uh, the immunosuppressants. So it suggested that Patient preferences do have a clear impact on the optimal treatment of patients with steroid refractory ulcerative colitis and average patient preferences support the use of medical therapy although one third would opt for surgery but again more than two thirds patients preferred uh, medical therapy over surgery. The another recent study again suggested it was a modeling study which looked at the initial health state and the final health state and when the final st health state was remission or mild symptoms. Patients prefer to avoid J pouch even with the low term, long term, low risk of lymphoma and serious infection. So this was the perspective of surgery, though it leads to a good quality of life, but there are certain complications in the long term and patients usually prefer medical therapy over surgery. Now what about the rescue therapy? So we have four options, cyclosporine, which we give uh, uh, in intravenously for the first five to seven days and followed by three months of oral cyclosporine and then we maintain with azathioprine. We have infliximab, we initially give at intravenous infusion of at 0 to 6 weeks or we can give accelerated regimen and then maintain with uh, uh, the scheduled infliximab infusions coupled with as that happening for the initial 6 to 12 months to decrease the immunogenicity. We can give tacrolimus although we have limited data and uh, trophocytative has come off late and is an effective option for patients who have steroid refractory acute severe colitis. So if surgery has uh, and then if we look at the outcomes of uh, the rescue therapy, then up to one year, up to 60% patients will avoid colectomy and both cyclosporine and infliximab are effective. And if we, have the if we look at the long-term outcomes, we have the follow-up of the CICIF trial, which was a landmark trial comparing cyclosporine and infliximab with over a median follow-up of 6.5 years, 65% patients were free of colectomy and both these options were equally effective. Now, if we have concerns with the surgery, we also have concerns with the long-term rescue therapy. The most important concern, especially with infliximab, is the risk of tuberculosis. However, as Dr. Vinay had already discussed, a stringent screening with a family history, active contact, monto, igra, and CT chest can avoid, the risk, can avoid this risk as shown in this recent study. We have risk of other infections such as herpes zoster, but this can again be avoided with the vaccination in the appropriate opportunity using the minimum dose and regular monitoring. We again have the risk of malignancy with these immunosuppressants, but as shown recently in a study from India that there is a minimal risk of lymphoma and non melanoma skin cancer with azathioprine use. This is mostly in young males, so we need to select the patients appropriately and risk again increases with the double immunosuppression. So we usually use azathioprine only for 6 to 12 months if we are using NTTNF therapy. The other risk is the loss of response, which there is, which is a risk, but with the uh, available options and we have increasing number of options in India, we can switch to another therapy. And we also have a risk of cost, but again, a recent study between uh, from 
Ludhiana aims showed the efficacy of azathioprine maintenance after infliximab induction in patients with acute tuberculitis. And we also reported the similar efficacy between biosimilar and the original molecules, which can reduce the cost and mitigate this concern of cost associated with the long term immunosuppression use. Yeah, sorry for this interruption. So this, uh, so, and then if we look at uh, the other concern which is there that once the patient has become steroid refractory and is given re rescue therapy, and if he fails rescue therapy, then he will be opted for colectomy. So does the, res does the use of rescue therapy affect the outcomes of surgery? So if these three studies which have shown there are similar median time to colectomy and complication rates between patients who underwent surgery after steroid refractiveness for the person who underwent surgery after uh, being uh, refracted to rescue therapy. And similarly, similar in, hosp in hospital mortality and again similar risk of post-cooperative complication between the, these two group of patients indicating that if we use rescue therapy, it doesn't affect the outcomes of surgery if the patient doesn't respond to rescue therapy. Okay, now looking at the, if we compare the long-term quality of life between patients who underwent colectomy versus patients who were managed with medical therapy. So there is a diverse opinion. So this study published in GCC showed that the long-term outcome was better in patients who underwent IPA versus patients who were treated with medical therapy. And the other side, the recent study published in CGH indicated that patients who had IPA had a higher disability scores than patients who were treated with, uh, treated medically. So what do the guidelines say? So we, if we look at the recent ECO guidelines on surgical management of ulcerative colitis, then they suggest that either infliximab or cyclosporine should be used in adult patients who, are, who have a steroid refractory UC. Third line sequential rescue therapy after failure of initial rescue therapy should only be used in, uh, in the specialized centers with the counseling of the patient and with patient's uh, consent and reconstructive surgery should be offered to refractory and corticosteroid dependent patients and it improves the quality of life despite the risk of early and late complications. And the, uh, guide, the American Society of Colorectal Surgery suggests that a multidisciplinary approach including early surgical consultation should be used to guide optical care in hospitalized patients with moderate to severe UC undergoing escalation of medical therapy. And patients who have severe medically refractory UC, fulminant colitis, toxic bacolon or colonic perforation should undergo colectomy. So I would summarize with this figure, which I took from a recent review by Dr. Bemelman. So between day one to day three, patient is started on intravenous steroids. Surgery is only if patient has a low, massive lower gene blade or perforation. By day two, day three to day five, if the patient is non-responder, we usually go for a rescue therapy with any of these agents. Surgery again, if patient has a toxic megacolon, previous refractory disease, again, or a uh, severe disease in the form of a uh, massive bleed or perforation. And by day five to day seven, if the patient has not responded to the first line rescue therapy, then sequential therapy only if the center is experienced disc after discussing with the patient. Otherwise, surgery would become the first choice in this situation. Thank you. I think we'll have uh, the talk from the surgeon first and then we'll have the questions there. Uh, I'll invite uh, Dr. Anand. Dr. Anand is a gastro surgeon who is associated with Noble Institute of Gastroenterology. He will be talking on the is the role of surgery in ulcerative colitis, steroid refractory, and is surgery the final answer?
very good morning one and all and uh, i must congratulate uh, yogesh for conducting this beautiful uh, program and i must also appreciate the previous speaker who had make sure that uh, the surgeon's roles are very limiting but i promise that i will make some space in this entire auditorium well the debate i have been given is is the surgery is the final answer for severe refractory ulcerative colitis i would obviously say that the uh, ulcerative colitis has been treated by not only physician but surgeons also when we are seeing from the physician sides we will always see uh, in term of less invasive gut sparing disease modifying that is a new terminology i have seen in this paper and the cons of surgeries are invasive loss of gut post operative complications when we see on the surgeon's perspective he always says that it's more definitive quick symptoms relief can cure in some instance as well as cost benefit and the long long risk of dysplasia as well as malignancy is less so when we progress we both are correct what i feel is that we have a very less data regarding uh, choosing one option over other there is no single paper which mentioned that surgery is the final answer or the medicine is the final answer i must say that it is a just a confirmation bias on the both side when we look on the indian society gastroenterology consensus task force the itself says that the choice between the surgery and alternative medical therapy depends upon the local expertise as well as in a acute condition affordability of the patients and the patient choice itself when we see in the literatures uh, what is concern for us is there is a clear cut guideline which patient we have to take for upfront surgery and which are the relative indications for the surgery but there is one small subgroup of the patients which are steroid refractory ulcerative colitis this group of the patients who are on the steroids but we are not able to taper it tapering them within the 3 weeks and these are the group of the patients who have a long history they they do not present like a de novo so what is the concern is there any limit in intensified conservative therapy now we have a second line therapy we have a third line of therapy why so we are obvious obvious to prevent the colectomies <laughs> evidence says that when we are delaying the surgery in a sub optimal response group of the patient the surgical complication are bit higher so this is a very difficult for us to get a surgical patients who have not been previously exposed with a biological they have already drained out and when we operate them obviously the bit complications are going to be higher the previous speaker has correctly mentioned that the lot of patients are have a pouchitis but we have to remember surgery is the option it is not the cure we can repair it we can never replace the organ so that's why the outcome is are going to be inferior that we have to accept it uh this is a very well said uh, that the concern for surgeon for steroid refractory when the patients are not being referred on appropriate timing definitely the surgery is going to be a disastrous and literatures have mentioned both acute and chronic complications are well described when we look on the natural history of ulcerative colitis mild to moderate ulcerative colitis happen in 10 to 15% of the patients and this severity does changes over a period of time we do not have a exact etiology which group of the patients are going to behave bad and when we see the cumulative risk of relapse it goes 70 to 80% and colectomy rates in a general it is a 15% but definitely some group of the patient like refractory ulcerative colitis the chances may be much higher Uh, well in the literature has been given the role of rescue therapy that uh, infliximab the biological era and it has limited the uh, colectomy rates and but the still i feel that 20% of the patients are require emergency colectomy and as the time passes beyond 5 years the colectomy rate increases up to 50% well there are the variable factors for that like demographic disease activity as well as the patient's age and the extent of the disease well we look in the literatures there is a definitely short term and long term outcome of infliximab is there and it has shown very good remission rate almost close to 50 to 60% and the colectomy rates are substantially has decreased to 80 percentage when we look on the rcts between infliximab and cyclosporine we can see the initial infliximab has definitely has reduced the colectomy rate but as the time passes it is close to 40 to 50% so we are very clear that biological have a clear advantage at initial disease it does not does not altered after 5 to 10 years 
This is a, just a small video I am sharing of the patients who had presented with, with me with history of eight years of colitis and he had a frequent waxing and waning. I had given him the options of biological, but he is a farmer and he is showing me the selfie and shooting the video which I don't recommend. Uh, we can appreciate seeing that uh, he is a bloated. In the next picture we can see that he has a steroid uh, uh, side effects. And the third picture I am showing here is the night now when the biology has improved, the surgeons are also improved. Their training and experience has also improved. They have a more laparoscopic sign. So the stigma, the stigma of colectomy, particularly the physicians who are starting early practice should not be have. We should always see on the other perspective also. So surgery is a not a negative outcome. What I mean to deliver in this? When you look on the post-operative outcome of quality of life, there are n number of results they say that it returns to general populations. So good quality of life and functional outcomes are also there. When we see a medical versus surgical cost and post-operative quality out of life, there are plenty of evidence is there that the significant cost and frequent hospitalization are required in anti-TNF therapy. There was no difference was found in IBD cure. And there is a definitely I must agree that stool frequency and antidiarrheal medication use were higher in surgical treated patient. Definitely we are repairing, we are not replacing. So definitely there is a limitation of surgeries. Uh, this was the slide I have taken from one of the online uh, gastro YouTube uh, when I was looking for what is the cost of uh, this second line or rescue therapies. The, if you see it's closely 4.5 lakhs per annum. I have not added a hospital cost, investigation cost and what about the complications? So definitely surgery outcomes are uh, much better in a short term where the cost is the concern. How do I choose my patients? I think what the message I would give that uh, we always should look the predictors of failure of treatment because this subgroup of the patients would deserves that we need to counsel them which is the appropriate line of management for that. Now we have a Oxford criteria but I, I do feel that these are the criteria which are based on uh, large population cohort studies which are not replicable to uh, our populations. So the predictors to response to salvage therapies are high CRP, low albumin level, fecal calproctin, uh, the optimal dosing regimens we need to understand, the choice of rescue therapy which each individual patient such as comorbidity, previous medication and contraindication to therapy also we should uh, take an appropriate decision for that because we know that the 50% of the patients will still require a colectomy. So what I give a conclusion is surgery should not be appreciated as a negative content of the treatment modality. It's a good alternative to the prolonged conservative therapy for some patients. Biologics definitely have a role, but we should observe that as a bridge to the surgery rather than uh, replacement to the surgery. And we should always remember the primary aim should be reduce patient mortality over saving the colon. And obviously, I do agree, it is a multidisciplinary approach. The good outcome is when the treating physician is a gastroenterologist and initial itself in this group of the patient IBD specialist and the surgeons are involved. Thank you. Thanks for completing before time. So we, we can have one or two questions. Uh, Saurabh, uh, you can come onto the stage. So uh, we, from both the talks we can infer that probably the role of uh, gastroenterologist uh, physician and surgeon, uh, it's it's not uh, that of an adversary, but it is that of a complementary role in which a team approach really helps. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I am a nephrologist and transplanter. I am using cyclosporin and azathioprine lifetime. So we are ve it is a, they are very good drugs and can be used lifetime. Except drug drug interactions should be known. Cyclosporin level reduces severely with rifampicin. While as a, if some patients are having enzyme deficiency, then even a small dose of azathioprine can cause severe bone marrow depression. Or azathioprine cannot be used with allopurinol or febuxostate. So these points are to be kept. Otherwise, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, azathioprine, and MMF can be used lifetime. Yeah, we agree with you, sir. Uh, being a nephrologist, you have more experience than us in treating uh, with immunosuppressants. So I'm sure that your uh, experience matters to uh, yeah. Thank you. Point well taken. So
so yeah so i would conclude that uh, we need a close friendship between the surgeon and the gastroenterologist yeah. for the optimal care of the patient a uh, time is very important patient's decision is also very important and each day matters in acute severe ulcerative colitis so we have to be very closely monitor the patient we have to be vigilant and we all we call the surgeon on the day one when we manage our patient with asuc so it all depends upon the patient's response and the eventual decision so close friendship is the key so to again when we sort of when we talk of affordability it is always that in the uh, in a patient who is not very affording uh, maybe in the uh, government setting or in the public health setting surgery may be a one time uh, approach uh, whereas because the uh, patient may have to pay for the biologics or for the but now with uh, tofacitinib and other options available probably you know there we can have a balance so best thing is an informed choice given to the patient giving all the options and allow the patient to choose what exactly he wants and give give them both options uh, properly i think that would yeah i think thank you yeah thank you very much thank you sir and thank you chairperson next topic is extra intestinal malfunctions of ibd and its management hi good morning so today i am going to little bit short because of time constraint this is the extra intestinal manifestation of ibd you are uh, hearing about the ibd since last two hours so i think 90% has been covered but this lecture is particularly because most of the crowds are the physician slides okay so most of the crowds are physician so my first question is which is the best nsaids with strongest anti inflammatory property in joint pain with ibd how many are with the diclofenac okay how many with the acyclofenac okay how many with ibuprofen one or two hand and how many are with the mefenamic acid one or two hand the basic story okay is that try to avoid any nsaids in the ibd so that is the first message i want to give because joint pain is the most common extra intestinal manifestation you are encountered with the ibd and try to avoid any nsaids even if it is required you can use a cox2 inhibitor now what is the most attractive cms for the physician it is maybe a diabetes related how many are interested in the diabetes how many are interested in the more coronary artery disease okay how many are interested in endoscopy none how many are interested in the ibd okay so there are only one hand in ibd why is it so okay if you are dealing with a disease which is a lifelong disease which involves the immunosuppression immunomodulator okay and it significantly impacts the quality of the life of the patient and if you are going to treat it then you should have interest in ibd so understand your disease and if you are not able to understand try to involve the expert that is the second message i want to give in this forum so my half mission is completed with this okay now what is the extra intestinal manifestation it's an inflammatory pathology in patient with the ibd it is outside of gut but says the common pathogenesis or pathophysiology shares common environmental and genetic predisposition with ibd it is common in both ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease but it is a outside gut and up to 24% of the patient with the ibd may have a initially extra intestinal manifestation followed by the liminal disease so these are the pathophysiology and we are going to discuss pathophysiology for next 10 minutes don't worry i am not going to discuss this pathophysiology this slide is complete and nobody is uh, very much keen to understand the pathophysiology because we are so much busy in our practice that we are not able to go to the molecular level so that's why you need a expert for that okay and we have to thank the psm that did gives us a triad epidemiological triad for any disease environmental factor agent and host the same pathophysiology is that there is a host factor there is an environmental factor and that uh, there is a, a virulence factor that 
differentiate phenotypic differentiation of IBD from region to region. So we will be exploring this complex unsolved puzzle of IBD pathophysiology. It is just not like a malaria that you don't need anybody. Okay. So these are the extra-intestinal manifestation of inflammatory bowel disease. It may be a gastrointestinal. You see the how many it is a primary sclerosing cholangitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, hepatitis, erythema nodosum, pyoderma, gangrenosum, oral aphthous ulcers, sweet syndrome, orofacial granulomatosis, IBD related arthritis, peripheral, axial, anthocytis, epistleritis, anti-uveitis, pneumonitis, cardiovascular disease, thromboembolism, portal vein thrombosis, emboli. In fact, any organ can be involved in inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so because of the time constraint as, as well as the, I think this is a too lengthy, we are going to focus on the joint pain only. Why? Because this is the most common extra-intestinal manifestation you encountered in the IBD. Second, many patient, uh, many uh, physician practicing as a gastroenterologist or the rheumatologist are encountering with this IBD with the joint pain. So there are misconceptions, treatment of the intestinal inflammation, it's may automatically extend in the intestinal manifestation will be taken care of but it is a dependent or independent of the intestinal inflammation it is a complication of the IBD it is not a complication it's a separate entity okay it is extra intestinal complications are direct or indirect sequel of the intestinal inflammation Sup suppose a cutaneous fistula intracutaneous fistula so then it is a complication but it is not an extra intestinal manifestation and it is present in the Crohn's disease only. Though it is a more in the Crohn's disease, but ulcerative colitis is equally vulnerable for extra intestinal manifestation. And these are the disease which runs parallel with the inflammation in the intestine, that is the peripheral arthritis, erythema nodosum, episcleritis and scleritis. So if you treat intestinal inflammation adequately, 90-95% chance that this etiologies are automatically, this sorry, symptomatology or this extra intestinal manifestation automatically subside. But there are high variability, frequency ranges from 6% to 47%, but it is a more in the early disease. Young patients have a more extra intestinal uh, 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 intestinal manifestation compared to the older one, but it may be either before or after. There are environmental factors. Now, we are more focusing on the musculoskeletal extra intestinal manifestation. So most common is in IBD, up to 40 to 50 percent patient may have a extra intestinal manifestation in form of the musculoskeletal manifestation. But with in, uh, increasing the age, this is decreasing. Okay, so the, some patients who are presented in the early age with the IBD having chances of more musculoskeletal manifestation compared to the those who presented in the 50s or 60s. It affects the both peripheral as well as the axial skeleton. It is in the form of the arthralgia, arthritis, anthocytis. Anthocytis is the inflammation of the tendon, if any residents are there, tendons, ligaments and the joint capsule. So these are the type of the arthritis. What are the symptoms? You may have arthralgia or arthralgia with arthritis. It may be axial involvement in form of the enclosing spondylitis or isolated sacroiliitis or inflammatory back pain. There may be a ductilitis, anthocytis, and if you see the peripheral arthritis is uh, little bit uh, more common compared to the axial arthritis, particularly in the UC. Now, in the peripheral arthritis, the arthropathy, they have also divided in the two, that is the type 1 is the posi-articular and type 2 is the polyarticular. Okay, but this is also an older one. The recently it is said it is an earlier presentation. When the disease is progressive, automatically posi-articular will become a polyarticular. So, pos but why this is necessary? At the end, in the management, everything depends on the severity. If it is a peripheral joint, single joint your management is like that it, uh, there are multiple joint more severity more erosive you have to treat systematically but if you see the rheumatological standpoint rheumatology standpoint of view it's a part of the spondyloarthropathy family and they are typically zero negative and this contains the psoriatic arthritis ankylosing spondylitis uh, anthocytis uh, reactive arthritis and idiopathic acute anterior uveitis. 
So, do you think you require an expert? Can you tell how many of these are female, how many of these are male, who is a twin brother? Find the twin sister and how many girls are in the photo? It is difficult. You require some Chinese expert for this. The same for this, for the joint pain, you require some hematologist. For the IBD, you require some gastroenterologist. You see, it's a multidisciplinary approach, okay, and pathophysiology is not fully understood. So that's why we require a multiple approach. Do you know this? This is called a, this is a Henry Ford. And why I call him a button guy? There was a uh, interview of the Henry Ford, and everybody thought, though he, he was so rich, but he did, uh, didn't have any knowledge of making a car. So he simply said, I don't need any knowledge. I just have to push few buttons on my desk so most intelligent person comes to me and give me the knowledge. So as a physician, you have that power of that button. Okay. So don't hesitate to take opinion. Just press a button of rheumatologist. Just press a button of gastroenterologist. If you think there is a nutritional is compromised, just press a button of good clinical nutritionist and the combined you will make an excellent car or your excellent quality of life of the patients. This is the second message I want to give. Please try to involve, because it's a multi-system involvement, try to involve uh, expert in this. Because even, even as a gastroenterologist, we have some difficulties in understanding this disease and we uh, frequently go to the senior like we need Sir Rupa Madam for the further discussion to what we should do. So, second task is completed. Now, how is it different from the rheumatoid arthritis? Because when you are dealing with the joint pain, the first common diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis. Now, spondyloarthropathy arthritis is less commonly deforming, however, erosive uh, disease is reported and there is no reliable laboratory test. So, either RF factor or NTCCP may come positive or negative in the IBD related arthropathy. Normal ESR does not confirm and does not exclude the diagnosis. Okay, so how will you diagnose? So that's why you required an expert. Positive, positive nahi hai. Negative, negative nahi hai. Clinically confirmed nahi hai. That's why you required a multiple man to diagnose this. Now, idiopathic ankylosing spondylitis is more positive for HLAB27, but this is a group of spondyloarthropathy, so it's a hardly 50 to 70 percent of patient is HLAB27 positive. Same for the psoriatic arthritis and reactive arthritis. Now, uh, best diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis and sacroiliitis is with the MRI. MRI entrography can combine to see the gut inflammation as well as the uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, in inflammation in the uh, axial skeleton and IBD associated sacroiliitis is usually bilateral, it can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. So how will you manage this IBD? The most of the data comes from the ankylosing spondylitis for the axial arthropathy and from the psoriatic arthritis for the peripheral arthropathy. Okay, there is a no strong data which says the arthropathy in the IBD but it is reasonable to treat from this data. Just like nephrologist uh, says, the azathioprine we are using for the long time, cyclosporine we are using for the long time. So just for the tofacitinib, tofacitinib has used for the so many years for the, uh, by the rheumatologist. Okay, so however, immunopathophysiology of the disease is different, but not completely different, it's overlapping. Okay, so some drug which is effective in the idiopathic ankylosing spondylitis, it may not be effective in the IBD related spondylitis. So for example, interleukin-17 inhibitor which is beautifully work in the psoriatic arthritis but it will not affect the peripheral arthritis in the Crohn's disease. So what is the optimal treatment of the IBD related arthritis? Consideration of the activity of disease across the different domain, gut inflammation and outside. Manage the bowel inflammation is the first priority and that we have already discussed. How will you induce the remission, what are the treatments, you know, need to discuss that. The patient with the polyarticular disease and joint disease, if so, despite of this, despite of gut, uh, your gut is non-inflamed or uh, under remission, your joint pain remains persist, then you require a variety of the therapy. So, NSH in the IBD is controversial, 
COX-2 inhibitor is safe in the ulcerative colitis up to the two weeks. Use only if essential. Corticosteroid is helpful in peripheral arthropathy but not in axial arthropathy. And long term corticosteroid has its own side effect. Local steroid injection can be done if there is a peripheral arthropathy which can involve one or two joint. Now again, uh, the sulfacelazine is a good drug for the oligoarticular peripheral arthritis with the ulcerative colitis. What is practical mistake we are seeing? Uh, you are using a mesacol OD or a mesahans or mesalamine, any type of mesalamine which has a less oral biological availability for the joint pain. But if this patient is complaining of the oligoarticular peripheral arthritis, you just convert into the sulfacelazine and it may respond and it will act on the both gut as well as the joint. Azathioprine is not useful, hydroxychloroquine is not useful, Leflet HCQ is not useful. Leflunamide has no data but some benefit in the peripheral arthritis. Mithotrexate can be used in the Crohn's disease with concomitant peripheral arthritis, not axial. Infliximab and Adalimod is beautiful drug in the IBD arthropathy, any type of arthropathy, Eternacept is should be avoided. So, Ustekizumab approved for the treatment of UC and Crohn's disease but only effective in the peripheral arthropathy and skin uh, extensive manifestation, Tofacitinib in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, Filgotinib, Vedolizumab affects only gut, not joint. Okay, so in short, in short, surgery. In UC, if removal this is part of the colon, it will lead to the remission of the peripheral arthritis, not axial. In Crohn's disease, surgical removal doesn't affect the arthropathy. So, in Crux, peripheral arthropathy has a plenty of the option and easy to control. But when there is an axial arthropathy, it is difficult to manage with the drug. So in axial arthropathy, you advise the physical activity and the best choice is TNF alpha blocker. While in the peripheral involvement, you have plenty of the option. You can advise a local steroid, you can advise a systemic steroid, short course of COX-2 inhibitor, you can use a methotrexate, even you can use a ustekizumab, tofacitinib. Many drugs can be tried, but for the axial arthropathy, you have to switch towards the TNF alpha. And this is the algorithm. You have two types of the patient. One has a disease in remission plus arthropathy and one has a disease active with arthropathy. So first is the disease active with uh, arthropathy then you have to achieve the remission and if it is axial arthropathy switch towards the uh, significant then switch towards the TNF alpha blocker. And if it is a there peripheral uh, uh, arthropathy you have plenty of the option which involves the both gut as well as the joint but this is in the remission and patient complaints of the joint pain then uh, in the peripheral uh, arthropathy switch toward the sulfacelazine from the uh, mesalamine and add on some other drugs or local steroid or something like that to control it in short it induce the remission induce the remission in ibd and if there is a peripheral arthropathy various options sulfacelazine cox inhibitor steroid methotrexate tofacitinib in surgery but if it is axial arthropathy you require a TNF blocker. I hope, is it helpful to understand a little bit? So, mission completed. Thank you, thank you. I think lack of time? Okay. I think we can take one or two questions. Sir, I have one question, like, uh, is there any role of eye examination, what should be the frequency and how should we uh, tell a patient regarding the eye examination and eye complaints for us? You see, usually uh, f uh, we don't recommend screening in each and every uh, IBD patient because you see the range is variable. Practical, what I am telling you in the clinical scenario. Okay, but if the patient has some symptoms, Okay, such so suppose photophobia, eye ache, then you go for the first screening. And uh, what happens, uh, what is the basic problem is, suppose patient develops the episcleritis. What we used to do, we just give a ciplox eye drops and go away. Okay, but you have to uh, keep in the background in the mind that this patient has an inflammatory bowel disease and it may be possible that it is not controlled right now because episcleritis is parallel to the IBD. Okay, so it may not be controlled 
IBD that lead to the episcleritis and you have to escalate the treatment or change the treatment. Okay, but uveitis, sometimes it may lead to the loss of vision, so always go for the ophthalmological examination. So always become a button guy. Either gastroenterologist, you should go for the ophthalmological examination or you should take opinion of the rheumatologist. There is no harm. Sir, is there any role of biosimilars in such cases? And what is the role of hydroxychloroquine? Hydroxychloroquine has no role in IBD-related arthropathy. That's I have already mentioned in the slide. What happens? When you see a joint pain, okay, your first drug will be either NSH or COX-2 inhibitor and third is hydroxychloroquine. NSH is controversial, I personally don't use. COX-2 inhibitor, if this is in the remission in ulcerative colitis, you can use, but hydroxychloroquine is not useful. Biosimilar, it has a role. Okay, there is nothing like it is in don't role, but you, uh, concept of biosimilar is different. Biologics and biosimilar is a little bit different. Okay, so but biosimilar can be used. Thank, thank you sir for such a elaborate talk on such a difficult topic. Usually we miss extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Chairperson. Next topic is complications of Crohn's disease and its management. For that, I would like to invite Dr. Partha Palsa, Dr. Apurva Vyasar, and Dr. Prateen Bhatsar as a chairperson. The speaker will be invited by the chairperson. Sir, uh, good morning everyone and uh, I like to invite Dr. Vinit Ahuja sir for uh, his lecture. Good afternoon everyone. I'd like to congratulate Yogesh on doing an excellent meeting. And again, grateful to him for inviting me. Now, when we talk about complications of Crohn's disease, you know, like Crohn's disease is a progressive disease. It starts as an inflammatory disease over a period of four or five years. It can move on to a stretching disease or a fistulizing disease. The fistula may be perianal or the fistula may be intestinal. So, since I have a uh, duration of 12 minutes, so I thought that I would just concentrate on one complication and that is perianal fistulizing disease and talk about it in terms of what do we need to know. So if you are going to deal with a case of perianal fistulizing disease, which would be around 10% of case of Crohn's disease, first thing is that you really need to know the anatomy out here because this is one disease where if you don't know the anatomy, you are not going to be able to treat the disease. So simply you, uh, there's an external anal sphincter, subsequently there's an internal anal sphincter, and then you have the pelvic floor muscles. Why is this anatomy important? Because this anatomy will help you decide whether the patient has a simple fish lay or a complex fish lay. There are many kinds of classifications which are available. But for a gastroenterologist, this AGA classification is probably the easiest and the best, and it has a bearing in terms of managing disease. So that is why it is very important. When we talk about a simple fish lay, we are talking about a low origin, a single external orifice, no pain or fluctuation suggesting perianal abscess, no rectovaginal fish lay. When we talk about a complex perianal fish lay, we are talking about a high origin, multiple external orifices may be associated with a perianal uh, abscess or a rectovaginal fistula. Besides that, there's another classification which the radiologists deal with, so we should be conversant with the terms that we have what is known as the superficial fistula, a transphytic fistula, a suprasphyntric fistula, or an intrasphyntric fistula, which as the terms are, the terms themselves are self-explanatory, but at, uh, the most important I would still say is a simple fistula versus a complex fistula, and that is something, the first step which we, we need to, or the first thing which we need to decide. How do I decide whether the patient has a simple fistula or a complex fistula? What investigations should I do? So you can do MR pelvis, 
A surgeon can do examination under anesthesia. If you are an endoscopist, like you guys, you can do an endoscopic ultrasound. Which of them is, are they all equal? Yes, they are all equal actually in terms of efficacy. And MR pelvis gives the same kind of diagnostic accuracy as EUA as maybe endoscopic ultrasound. It is just that MR pelvis is something which is much more easily available, much more easier to use. Third question. There are so many patients with perianal fistula. Do all of them have Crohn's disease? You have to decide whether this perianal and particular fistula is associated with Crohn's disease or not. How do you decide that? Because the most common cause of perianal fistula is idiopathic cryptoglandular fistula. That is what the surgeons generally see. Until now, the surgeons just saw the fistula, treated them, healed them, or they, when they, whenever they had a recurrence, they came back to them, they never sent it to a gastroenterologist. Over the last two, three years, what I've seen is that many of the times, they start sending patients with perianal fistula to a gastroenterologist because they are, now they know that, okay, Crohn's disease exists in India. Crohn's disease is associated with perianal fistula, and they want to rule out patient to, uh, whether the patient has Crohn's disease or not because that would have a bearing on management. So, what are the further investigations when the patient comes to you we would like to do? Is we want to find out if the patient has Crohn's disease, uh, do an ileal colonoscopy, whether there is any colonic involvement, do a MR enterography or a CT enterography to find out if there is any small bowel involvement or not. Are there, what are the other differentials? One is tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, the fistula rate, perianal fistula would be just 1% of cases of abdominal tuberculosis. But since abdominal tuberculosis is still rampant in India, so that 1% is also a sizable number. So always rule out tuberculosis in such a setting, and that can easily be done with the help of you know, taking a biopsy from that side. Another differential is heredonitis superativa. In heredonitis superativa, sinuses are formed because of the sebaceous glands. These sinuses can be there in the perianal region, in the vulval region, they can be there in the axillary region, and all these need to be ascertained, ruled out. It can really mimic Crohn's disease. In Crohn's disease, you'll have fish lay. In heredonitis superativa, most of the times, you would not have fish lay, but you would have sinuses. But sometimes both of them can coexist. But again, here, one need not be too afraid because the treatment for heredonitis superativa is also antibiotics followed by biologicals like a dalimumab. So even if there's a confusion, you can go ahead. Now comes whom all to involve in care. We just heard Soman and he gave a beautiful example, I think, of the button guy. And that is the thing which uh, applies actually in most of these diseases now. You need a multidisciplinary team. If you think that as a gastroenterologist you're going to manage perianal fistula, you'll be sadly mistaken. You need a colorectal surgeon, a radiologist, and also a dietitian. So how do I treat perianal fistula? There are two principles. One is inflammation, the other is infection. And both of them are very, very important for a case of fish lay. If you think that it is Crohn's disease, so there should be only inflammation. I need to treat inflammation with the help of immunomodulators, steroids, and with the help of biologics that will take care of the fish lay. You'll be again very wrong because inflammation is driven by infection and infection drives inflammation. So you need to treat both of them simultaneously. How do you treat the infection? You treat with the help of antibiotics. If there's a perianal abscess, that needs to be drained. And to put in a seat on thread. Seat on thread is actually what I would say very essential in managing any case of perianal fish lay, even if it is associated with Crohn's disease. Inflammation, you this is a kind this is the kind of Crohn's disease where you would start with top-down therapy. When we say top-down therapy is that you may start with biologics instead of starting with 5 say or starting with steroids or starting with azathioprine. Here it would be much more prudent to start with biological straight away. Question is, are you going to do only biologics? So you're going to do only antibiotics? What are you going to do? You are going to do with all of them. You're going to throw everything in for a case of perianal fistula because you have to treat inflammation, you have to treat infection. You treat infection with the help of antibiotics, training abscesses, putting in a seat on thread, and you decrease inflammation with the help of biologics, and subsequently you add azathioprine. You add azathioprine. Why? To increase the efficacy of biologics, to decrease the immunogenicity of biologics. Which biological small molecule are you going to use? You again have these various choices. In Fliximab, and at, at the best data is available for Fliximab. Second best data is available for Dalimumab. Ustekinumab is coming up with some good data. Tofacitinib does not have, as I told you earlier, has no role in Crohn's disease. So you can use Fliximab or Dalimumab as the first line therapy. And in case there's a loss of response to Fliximab or Dalimumab, you can move over to 
uh, us taken a map until that time it's not available you may use bodolizumab when is the best time to start anti tnf therapy it's a top down is a model for top down therapy the inflammation burden is much more than in a given inflammatory or liminal case of crohn's disease so you need to get balzic straight on the moment you confirm the diagnosis the moment you have ruled out tuberculosis the moment you are very sure it is not a idiopathic cryptoglandular fistula the garden variety with the surgeon see once you realize it's a fistula associated with crohn's disease you take care of infection treat inflammation straight away with the help of balzics and as as i told you that the balzics here they require longer therapy duration before you call it a failure there are higher trough levels which are required if you are going to monitor the drug levels and the best the most stringent way of monitoring the responses with the help of radiological resolution not just symptomatic response can we stop balzics even though these patients are having a heavy burden of inflammation yes you can stop balzics in around 50% of cases as has been seen that even though if you stop 50% of uh, in cases you stop balzics the relapse rates would be around 50% but 50% patients would be doing well so you can give a drug holiday after one or two years once you have shown that radiological healing has occurred in these particular cases what all the surgeon can do the surgeon has still not come into the picture the surgeon can do a lot starting from cetone thread cetone thread has to be put in every case of complex fistula but the kind of thread which has to be put in is non cutting the loose cetone thread a cutting cetone is contraindicated in a case of complex perianal fistula why because it will cause anal incontinence the surgeon can do video assisted anal fistula therapy or lift that is a ligation of intersynthetic tract fistula and all but fecal diversion is one thing which the surgeon can do and that is useful in refractory cases where you have tried many a lot, a lot of things they are not successful of the patient is not able to afford biological therapy as a therapy is not working at all then fecal diversion can be done but fecal diversion helps there is a good response but the sad thing is that ultimately only in 20 to 20 percent of cases only you are able to maintain restore the continuity so if you are going to do fecal diversion in a young case be aware of this fact that the long term results may not be very good and also remember that perianal fistula is associated with the risk of malignancy in terms of anal cancer or at the site of the fistula what about the refractory cases you have done all these things still the patient is not responding and it does happen we do see such cases in referral centers and all then the uh, one thing is to build upon the nutrition you can give exclusive enteral nutrition and it does have a role in terms of not only improving the nutritional status of the patient but also in terms of it has a anti inflammatory effect then hyperbaric oxygen therapy chambers if they are available then 10 20 or 30 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen therapy may help in fistula healing which has been seen in studies as well as in meta analysis and in as part of clinical trials some of these cases can also be included in mesenchymal stem cell injection for the perianal fistula this has already become a standard of care of therapy in europe and out here also trials are going on which have shown 50 to 60% response after stem cell injections were given where this is radiological healing which occurred after stem cell therapy which was done for patients for a clinical trial at our center or this is again showing the clinical response which occurs and these are cases which were refracted to tnf therapy what about the low socio economic group patients who cannot afford anything does azathioprine really work in such a setting yes azathioprine does work as it was seen that around in north india when peco or cohort was followed up around 40% of patients by 4 years they were still maintaining a good response so it's not that every patient if the patient cannot afford biological therapy life is doomed for that particular patient no you start as a therapy and give antibiotics put in a seat on thread and there is a chance that that patient may respond and life may be good for that patient and then you also have enteric fistulas which are there if there are enteric fistulas there the question arises the patient comes with enteroenteric fistula enterovaginal fistula entero uh, vesical fistula what to do here the concept is that you want to not only take care of the inflammation and the infection you also want to retain the amount of intestine which you are going to resect because ultimately the patient is going to require intestinal resection so what are you going to do are you going to send the patient for surgery first or are you going to start the patient on anti tnf therapy first that's a question which is often asked so this data shows that this is a retrospective cohort data which shows that irrespective of whatever you start both of them seem to be equally efficacious as long as you have taken care of the infection
If you have taken care of infection well, then you do surgery, you have downgraded the amount of understand you are going to reset. If you have taken care of infection well and you start the patient on anti-TNF, then the anti-TNF would work more, would have higher chances of getting success. Most of the cases you end up with both surgery as well as anti-TNF therapy. So finally to conclude, this is uh, what Sonnen started as a button man uh, example, beautiful example. When it comes to complicated uh, uh, Crohn's disease, particularly perianal fish loss and Crohn's disease, what requires a multidisciplinary approach. First of all, what you need is a detailed anatomical description and the simplest is simple fistula or a complex fistula. Whether it's a fistula with single opening, low fistula or multiple openings, high fistula or with perianal abscess and all. And how do you decide that? You decide that with the help of either doing a MRI pelvis, US or EUA, then you have to decide whether the patient has really Crohn's disease or it is tuberculosis or hedonitis separativa, how you can do that with the help of ileocolonoscopy colonoscopy and doing a CT enterography or MR enterography. And thereafter, if it's a simple fish slide, it's very easy to treat. You just need to give antibiotics, you can put in a non-cutting seat on drainage and continue the patient in azathioprine. Whereas if it's a patient with complex perianal disease, you need to take care of infection, you need to take care of inflammation. Top-down therapy with the help of anti of therapy would be required. Again, Seton is very essential and surgeon's role is very essential out there. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, sir, for wonderful lectures. Any questions from the audience? Sir, can I ask you a question, sir? sir uh, what about the newer antifibrotic therapies? Because once these complications develop, we don't have uh, antifibrotic therapies. All these biologics, once this fibrosis develops, they don't work much. So, so antifibrotic are we, are therapy will hold true for structuring Crohn's disease. Whenever you have a structuring Crohn's disease, so there if you give antifibrotic therapies, it may work because inflammation has been taken care of by biologics. But right now we do not have a single antifibrotic therapy which works. I am sure that the antifibrotic therapy when it comes out, it will be good both for liver diseases as well as intestinal structures. Right now if it's a fibrotic structure, the best therapy is structuroplasty or structure resection. Sir, any change for pediatric uh, fistulizing Crohn's disease? Uh, I'm an adult gastroenterologist, do not have so much of experience with pediatric fistulizing Crohn's disease, but what I do uh, find out when I discuss with my colleagues is that if you have a case of fistulizing Crohn's disease, that also somebody who is less than six years of age, what we call it, call it as very early onset IBD, if possible, go in for exome sequencing. That is, look for the monogenic variant of fistulizing Crohn's disease. Right now I was uh, sitting with a gentleman, like, sir was asking about, they had a kid who is six, less than six years old of a, a age with ulcerative colitis, not responding to therapy. Should surgery be done in such a kind of case or not? Well, the thing is, yes, surgery would be very difficult at, at that kind of age. You would like to try with medical therapy. But if in these are the kind of cases where you would like to rule out monogenic IBD with the help of doing exome sequencing, because if you find a single gene which is a culprit, then perhaps one marrow transplant would be the answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Chairperson. Next up is International IBD. For that, I would like to invite Dr. Harbik Gupta and Dr. Harbik Pariksar as a chairperson. The speaker will be invited by the chairperson. So good afternoon. Uh, today I shall talk about interventional IBD, a new frontier. As already discussed in uh, Dr. Somin Shah's talk that uh, here no one is interested in endoscopy, but maybe after this talk someone maybe get interested in endoscopy for IBD. As we have seen, as Dr. Ahuja showed, 
that once this uh, mechanical complications develop like stricture, fistula, abscess, there is usually you have to do a mechanical therapy in the form of surgery. But there is an uh, emerging role of interventional inflammatory bowel disease therapies in this. And these complications develop usually in a specific sequence. Initially there is chronic inflammation, then there is stricture, then there is fistula which leads to abscess formation. The role of in, uh, interventional IBD in Crohn's are stricture, fistula, abscess, treatment of surgical leaks, retrieval of retained capsule endoscope and bleeding. In ulcerative colitis, it is colitis associated neoplasia, management of post pouch complications and bleeding. And as we know that 30% of the patients with ulcerative colitis even will have post-operative complications. So even surgery is not curative and there is risk of colorectal neoplasia, interventional IBD has a role. So endoscopic stricture therapy, basically it has three forms of therapy. One is to dilate that we can do the endoscopic balloon. We can cut with a knife or we can put a stent, self-expanding metal stent. If there is a fistula or abscess, there are a few basic therapies. Usually for other fistula and abscess, we may usually close it. But for IBD associated fistula, we would like to drain it initially rather than close it. And as we have seen that most of the cases will be associated with the stricture, the stricture should be dilated or treated first, followed by the fistula or abscess therapy. Then we can do a cutting, which is known as fistulotomy, that is useful for chronic fistulas. We can do filling agents like glue, plugs, stem cells for chronic fistula. And finally, you can use clips for acute anastomotic leaks as post-operative complications. Approach to chronology stricture, I am not going into details, but for the physicians, I would like to highlight the fact that when the stricture is more than 5 cm, and on radiology, you can see there is a pre-stenotic dilatation, significant pre-stenotic dilatation more than 5 cm. These are the patients that will not respond to endoscopic therapy and that should be referred to the surgeons. And even if the uh, strictures are more than uh, 4 in number. Very short strictures, they can be cut open with the stricture uh, tomy or balloon dilatation can be done. Little longer strictures, balloon dilatation has to be done, not stricture tomy. And if initial therapy fails, you can either use a stricture tomy or put a stent. And if there is inflammation, you should use your medical therapy first, followed by this. Then how to select cases? If there is this uh, fistula or abscess, is uh, they are within the 5 cm of stricture, you should not do uh, balloon dilatation or endoscopic therapy in these cases. Also, you should be very careful in females and others to avoid the anterior wall of rectum because there are all the genital structures are there which may get damaged if you do uh, the stricture therapy or fistula therapy there. And usually these web-like strictures, they are more uh, prone to uh, uh, response to endoscopic therapy whereas the spindle type strictures and ulcerative strictures are prone to complications. Usually you should stop steroids if the patients are on therapy, stop anticoagulant before you subject these patients and pro probably a prophylactic antibiotic has to be given. And these are the settings for these and usually for the gastroenterologist I just want to mention this is the setting with the endogut Q313 because it re reduces the risk of bleeding in these cases. So what are the problem with the balloon? Why do we need other therapies? The main problem with the balloon is Recurrent symptoms are seen in half of the patients if you do a balloon dilatation. The patients will keep coming back to you and two-thirds will ultimately require a dilatation or surgery. So, uh, uh, this is our experience. We have published, uh, this, uh, this is going to be published in uh, next issue of Journal of Digestive Endoscopy. 46 patients, we have dilated uh, almost uh, 70 strictures of uh, almost 99 sessions of dilatations and we have dilated ulcerative strictures as well in the IC valve and sigmoid and that actually prevented surgery in these patients and these patients are doing well on medical therapy. Also in post-operative pouch complications, some patients have Crohn's disease of the pouch and uh, we are treating them with both uh, balloon dilatation as well as medical therapy and they have responded. Although the short follow-up time is shorter, in the long term I am finding more and more patients are coming back because of the recurrent symptoms. So that's why we need other forms of therapy. Like in this case of duodenal Crohn's, we dilated this three times and it recurred. So we did uh, radial incision and cutting of the stricture. And after that, the patient used to come back every month after this uh, balloon dilatations. But after almost eight months of follow-up, the patient has not come back again. 
So this is another form of therapy. Like esophageal, esophagus also you can do it, like esophageal ESD for refractory esophageal stricture or a rectal uh, anastomotic stricture, you can do a stricture tomy. So uh, that can be really helpful and prevent further surgery in these patients. So that can be really useful in refractory strictures. And also you should keep in mind that esophagus and duodenum are the very high risk zone uh, because if there is perforation that will lead to mediastinitis and uh, mortality. But the rectum, uh, rectum and the pylorus and the IC valve are the very zone one that is good area because even if you develop a perforation, the maximum the patient will have a stoma but uh, chances of severe complication is there. Also post-operative anatomy has to be kept in mind in this because the anatomy may change the location of the stricture. So balloon versus knife, knives usually the long term success rates is higher, bleeding rates are higher compared to balloon whereas balloon perforation rates are higher and the long term efficacy is lower. That is it I want to tell here and uh, actually in stricture tomy you can decide on which side to cut whereas in balloon dilatation it is uncontrolled, you cannot control the side when to cut. If you actually perforate on the mesenteric side that will form a mesenteric abscess which lead to higher amount of intestine to be resected whereas a free perforation actually the patient will have a stoma but uh, intestinal resection can be minimized. So it has been compared with uh, balloon as, and as well as uh, ideological resection for anastomotic stricture and it has been seen that reintervention rates were similar. So as we have learned in case of achalasia cardia the treatment has changed from surgeon's knife to endoscopic balloon to endoscopic knife time is there to come when uh, it will come for uh, uh, the patient will for mechanical complication will come to the endoscopist for therapy. So these are the different stents. I don't want to go into details of these stents that are used for management of inflammatory bowel disease. They are usually self-expanding metal stents. Usually the success rate is close to two-third of the patient will have success. But the main drawbacks are spontaneous migration which can occur in up to 44 percent cases and also some will uh, it up to 20 percent will can have pain abdomen after this. So this is a randomized control trial, only one of the randomized control trials, a few of the randomized control trials in interventional IBD which showed that it is not superior to endoscopic balloon dilatation but uh, actually it can be useful in longer and refractory strictures. So we may still need an ideal stent for Crohn's. For if, if you are doing these procedures, you should have an interventional radiology and surgical backup because the perf uh, complications like bleeding and perforation may not be closed uh, uh, endoscopically in all the cases. Then going to the fistula and abscess therapy, you drain the abscess if there is, it is there, locate the fistula entry and exit site and then you can cut open the exit site and close the internal opening but never do closure for the bowel, uh, bowel to internal hollow organ fistulas. So this is a uh, video I will show in which we have done endoscopic seton therapy, actually in simple short superficial fistulas we can do it and this patient was having recurrent pus discharge on biologics and after putting this set on the patient is doing well. But sometimes we have to uh, uh, put a clip to secure this set on because they may get displaced over time. So these are the different therapies that I already mentioned. Sometimes also uh, you may need an endoscopic ultrasound guidance to drain a pelvic abscess or a world, uh, if there is uh, intervention radiology is not feasible because of overlying bowel. There is in refractory strictures actually uh, there is a role for fistula ESD and uh, closure by OTSC that has been described recently and also I would like to show this video of if capsule impacted in the distal jejunum which was removed with a uh, cap, uh, spiral enteroscopy. As you can see we dilated the stricture as well as then we uh, the patient was having actually appendicitis and uh, melina for which this video capsule endoscope was done which got retained that we removed with spiral enteroscope. So this is our experience of four cases of removal of uh, retained capsule with spiral enteroscope. And also this is, a, this is a systematic review that I have done for uh, management of ulcerative colitis associated neoplasia. Actually this ulcerative colitis patient long standing disease they may develop uh, ulcerative colitis associated neoplasia and this is seven cases in our series. And as you can see we can do endoscopic submucosal dissection, endoscopic mucosal resection as well as normal polypectomies for this. And it can be challenging because of the sub, a lot of submucosal fibrosis in these patients 
but still uh, uh, earlier only one hour high grade dysplasia was there, patient was used to be referred to the surgeons, there is actually emerging role of endoscope, interventional endoscopist in this. Then managing post-operative pouch complications in ulcerative colitis. In ulcerative colitis, after the pouch, they may develop complications in the inlet pouch, the anastomosis in the, they may develop pouchitis, they may develop leak at the tip of the J that can be managed with uh, endoscopic therapies. And as you can see, uh, pouchoscopy is very important in this. As I am doing this, the anastomotic side, then going to the pouch body, then the outside appearance, then uh, I am going to the pre-pouch ileum, and I am finding ulcers are there in the pouch body. This patient is having pouchitis. And after listening to uh, the lecture of Boshan last, uh, last week, I am also now doing pouchograms for these patients. Uh, sorry. Yeah, which can be very useful to see uh, if there is any uh, functional um, evacuation defects in the pouch and also uh, sometimes the upper part of there may be a fistula or there may be intussusception in this uh, pouch. So, all the post-operative pouch complications, mainly sectures, leaks, fistula, sinuses, if they are short, and also pouch neoplasia, if they are unifocal and polypoidal, they can be managed with interventional IBD. Also, this is an example in, uh, in which uh, we have uh, used a single balloon endoscope. Uh, this patient was having recurrent bleeding, and actually this patient is on follow-up for last one, year, one and a half year and has not bled again. Although uh, he has recently come again with uh, anemia, but again his, it was controlled medically and we have reported three cases in our series of control of bleeding. So interventional endoscopists have, have to have this electrosurgery skill, resection skills, then uh, minor skills like hemostasis, suturing skills, knowledge of IBD, now advanced imaging skills because NBI and all may be important, transrectal ultrasound or endoscopic ultrasound and deep endoscopy skills. So all the endoscopy skills are important for interventional IBD specialist and which can uh, act as a bridge for surgery. So why uh, this IBD therapeutic endoscopy is difficult because often the bowel anatomy is altered, there is underlying gut disease. Uh, and the tissue at the complication site is often inflamed or fibrotic, there is a lot of submucosal fibrosis and there is a transmural disease so most of the therapies don't work there. And bowel preparation is often poor, concomitant steroids and biologics uh, many of the patients are on and the nutritional status is poor, if you develop complications uh, then uh, the consequences may not be great. So you have, need to have experience if you want to do this therapy. So take home message is interventional IBD is a bridge between medical and surgical therapy. After the medical therapy, if there is disease progression, the stricture, fistula and abscess or neoplasia, you can, before surgical intervention, you can use this in appropriately selected patients. After the surgery, if the patient develops complications like disease recurrence or post-operative complications, then also endoscopies may have a role. So thank you. If you want to know more about endoscopy in IBD, I would uh, invite you to next year's conference in April. Thank you so much. Excellent lecture and uh, it's a good uh, new topic. It is a bridging between the medical surgery key. during treatment even post-surgical uh, there is a good role of interventions. So is there any question from the audience? I think we can move ahead with the next session. Thank you sir and thank you chairperson. Uh, please wait at the end of the conference.